Shalom and be one family. This is a case from the black narrative and we are uh, this is actually a pre-recorded uh, special that we're going to be doing today. Um, I'm currently in Washington or we are currently in Washington District of Columbia and uh, we have an interesting topic here today. But first, I want to introduce uh, the guest that we have here today. Uh, he's a friend of the show. Uh, you've probably heard him in uh, another episode before. Uh, actually, an episode that we did uh, here in D.C. as well. And he's also the editor of uh, The Bible is Black History. Uh, Mark, if you could introduce yourself to the audience. Hello, everybody. It's uh, fantastic to be here for another time around. Um, I'm looking forward to the topics we'll go ahead and get into. And it's always a pleasure to have Akis come up so we can go ahead and collaborate on some stuff. Yeah. So um, the, the topic we're going to be touching on today I feel like it's one that's been uh, a long time coming, uh, especially with certain events like, uh, I feel like a, a kind of key mark event was the end of Blackish because I feel like that was like, um, it, truly that show did encompass, you know, you know, whatever opinions we do have about it, which, you know, uh, of course, if you heard my opinions, they're not too savory, but um, it does encompass a certain era of black television. It was probably uh, one of the biggest black TV shows of the 2010s. Yeah, I would say so. Right. So it's one of those things where now I'm noticing there seems to be a certain gap when it comes to black creativity uh, in, in the mainstream media. And we've got to consider when it comes to uh, uh, black creativity and, you know, black TV shows and just anywhere in media where we're portrayed. Oftentimes you have this interesting dance between reality and dance you know people some people say uh, uh art mimics life some people say life mimics art i believe it's kind of like a duality to it uh in a way so when it comes to um uh this conversation here uh, i think it would be good to open up a discussion to go over the legacy of uh black I mean, blacks in media, past, uh, specifically TV, past, present, future, and uh, kind of speculate about, uh, you know, speculate about the future of black television as well as being able to uh, look over uh, how we've been portrayed over the past, um, what, the past 60 years that uh, we've been kind of prominent in the media and look at the legacy of these different things. You know, I, I would like to start off by talking about the genesis of uh, uh, black TV. Like, um, you know, when we first began coming into television, you know, the TV shows, I mean, of course, like it was a during a time where you weren't going to have as much mixing between, you know, blacks and whites. So the TV shows were geared by, they were made by blacks for blacks. You know, when you had a, uh, uh, I mean, it's wildly different from how it was today. I mean, think about the thing about the the sitcom, you know, kind of medium, mm -hmm. and you know, you had I mean, white TV shows like uh, I Love Lucy and what have you, but oftentimes in these various TV shows, there was a a, a family structure to everything when it came to like black TV and everything, like just TV overall. But it was mirrored in black TV as well. But what do you think started to kind of change that? Well, so I was listening to you, and um, there were several things that I also wanted to get into before we even talk about the the full gamut of black TV and its origins. I right, think right, that right. a few things need to be clarified. Um, more specifically, when we were talking about Blackish being the largest black TV show, most popular, it I'm. Um, guess I want us to uh, say more so it is a b large black sitcom. Right, right, right. And this is about sitcoms or family TV mm -hmm. because there was right. plenty, there was an era in the 2010s of a lot yeah. of, you know, TVMA, um, TV shows mm -hmm. like uh, Empire, I remember. Boy, you, you do have a choice, uh, 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 you do have a, a point with that because... Um, and uh, consider the genre as well. Yes, and like how to get away with murder. Right. Um, and there was various things in the uh, what you could guess like call black TV drama. There was a right. few things going on in that. And I mean, obviously Tyler Perry and all BET specials have been going on 
Um, it's been a part of 20 years. In a perpetual nature. I guess what we're talking about is, you know, like the OG three main networks, like the ABC, NBC kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Those typically would host family entertainment kind of right, things. Right. And they would have sitcoms. Mm-hmm. So as far as what we're talking about when we say black TV, we mean uh, more specifically, specifically what we grew up watching and also what our kind of mindsets are focused on is Mm -hmm. uh, black sitcoms and going back to even you know like abc and nbc right um you have uh, an example i think that it would be really important to take it not only into the history of black sitcoms but also just take it back into sitcoms in general Right, right um because you know, as you were talking and mentioning, the nuclear family is a yeah. very strong central, you know, cornerstone of a sitcom. Right, because you also you have the nuclear family, which of course is, um, you know, it's it's the kind of the um, I guess a, a, a building block for civilization, you know, as overall. But also, um, like you said, with the when it comes to the sitcom versus the drama, uh, sitcoms are palatable for the whole entire family. So you're not going to have, you know, kids saying, you know, I grew up on Empire as much as you'll hear them say, you know, I, I, I grew up on Blackish, you know. And so you have the you have that aspect of, you know, the, the, the sitcom forming people's minds and opinions and realities a little more and also being used as a, a, a certain uh, maybe a standard. Or how uh, we should be living or, or the ideal kind of family life in a way. I definitely think that as far as America's propaganda machine and all the many facets and ways that, you know, mm-hmm. the life that you should live is, is shown in the media, yeah. uh, that definitely sitcoms are a, a gold standard of sorts. Right, right, right. And um, to even, even kind of uh, 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 transitioning, because one of... I would say, I mean, there there were a lot of very prominent early uh, sitcoms from, you know, Good Times, Sanford and Son. Uh, but one very uh, notable one that I wanted to touch on was The Cosby Show. You know, as far as, like, you know, discussing the legacy of that and how, I mean, we, we've got to be appreciative of these TV shows because you got to understand the era in which they came. You know, you think about the... the uh, the disparage, the what was it? disparity in uh, lifestyle that a lot of blacks had, and you know, um, the fact that the Cosby Show, you know, you got to give it props for showing a, a healthy black family within um, within a, a good neighborhood, a, a good lifestyle, and it taught good morals. But how um, you got to think about how realistic, you know, those that kind of standard of life was, you know, especially for our people. Because one thing to consider, or, or one thing that, that I've been uh, kind of thinking about when it comes to shows like that, is the whole art mirroring, mirroring life and life mirroring art. And sometimes uh, you have these various TV shows that I don't think um, really accurately portray the gamut of black experience. And you'll have these... Um, you know, various characters that are living, um, I guess, a more, I guess, a more, it's like you're having a, you know, it's going to sound a bit controversial, but it's almost like having a, a white family with black faces put on it. You know what I mean? Where, like, yeah, this is a black family, uh, uh, but, you know, we don't have that kind of support system that white society would have to garner uh, 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 a healthy relationship within those certain career groups you know because um we got uh, i think uh, claire was uh, a a lawyer in the cosby show i believe it was a doctor lawyer combo yeah it was a doctor and lawyer uh combo within the cosby show and you kind of consider how busy especially back in um and you think about back in those days i mean in any days a doctor and a lawyer are going to be busy but Yes, um, but I also do want to have one thing for a moment. Yeah. I think that for the uh, listeners to the broadcast, it would be important for us to explain a lot of big things 
when it comes to the huge concepts that are sitcoms because of like you said you know them being juggernauts in the media and the example of how to live life and things like that i think we need to take it all the way back start talking about like the tropes start talking about the eras you know how the straight man comes into this and all this stuff Mm. and show how not only because when you have these shows interacting with mass media Mm. the different changes in mass media affect the black tv shows right because i mean well to kind of touch on that i guess in uh uh to, to, to kind of touch on it especially when you brought up the whole point of the straight man uh and oftentimes it within uh the older tv shows the straight man was the father when we say the straight man you know we're, we're talking about the person that would be the voice of reason yes. you know and oftentimes the voice of reason would be the father in these uh, various cases. I mean, just like, for instance, in uh, the Cosby show, you know, Bill Cosby was oftentimes the straight man. He was the voice of reason. But you notice with uh, shows like, um, like, uh, what's that? The, the Simpsons, you know what I mean? Or even, uh, I mean, of course, it's kind of like a, a parody, but, you know, Family Guy and all these other shows, the, the father started becoming just a dope as time moved on, and that kind of uh, uh, showed society how, uh, uh, you know, how fathers were being, it, it showed how fathers were starting to be viewed and portrayed in the media. Yes, um, and we also need to remember, too, what a sitcom really is at its roots, and right. how the straight man goes into that, because, um, you know, a really big thing and a big reason why people watch these sitcoms was to see that kind of slice of life. Right. Where, you know, either a sitcom could be a day or it could transpire over a couple of days or weeks or months. Right. But it would be a slice of life and it would typically have a resolution with a lesson. Right, right, right. And more often than not, in the more historical examples of, say, the Andy Griffith show or um, the things like I Love Lucy and things like that, you would have the straight man, you'd have a submissive but snarky mom, Mm -hmm. um, or witty, I guess you could say, and then you would have the son, typically the more badass of the two, uh, and then a daughter that was, you know, a straight-A student, all this, that, and the next thing, and then maybe a dog or pet or something. Mm. So you would have these uh, very central tropes, and Mm -hmm. that was, well, there's actually a term, the golden age of television, Right, right. Um, And that was, you know, post-World War II Mm -hmm. and everything. If we're really bringing the history back, because so much of what America wanted after World War II, when they had become the world superpower, they wanted to demonstrate that wealth, demonstrate that prosperity. Right. And the media was Mm -hmm. another way of perpetuating that. That makes sense. And and it's funny because that even kind of uh, feeds into, you know, sometimes... Uh, 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 you meet people from a third world, co- quote unquote, third world country. Yes. And a lot of their perception of America is shaped by these different sitcoms. And that even kind of ties it back into, um, that's why it's good to have two people here. You know, it ties back into the whole thing of the Cosby show, for instance. Yes. Because the same way where the sitcom was born out of an era of uh, prosperity, uh, it's, it's, particularly during the 50s when you had the rise of uh, suburbia. Suburbia, yeah. the rise of discretionary income, exactly. the, the inception of the teenager. Exactly. You know, all these different uh, uh, marketing things and, you know, the, the this, this squaring off of markets. From that era comes the sitcom. And so the sitcom being used as a medium to... Uh, uh, man, that is really a good point. The sitcom being used as the medium to show what uh, uh uh to show america's strength yes it's not going to accurately portray blacks in a uh, uh uh accurate tangible way yes and this isn't to take away from the fact that we do have black doctors and we do have black lawyers but those shows always showed them with their families they always showed them you know having all these different lessons and stuff like that rarely showed them at work and it never, a show like The Cosby Show never showed the sacrifice that uh, uh, these doctors and lawyers have to make and have to go through, you know, in order to uh, 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 make that kind of income. And the sad thing about it is, yeah, you might uh, be able to make this income, that's a good thing, but we still don't have the sovereignty in black America, as black Americans, for it to be sustained over let's say, the next three, four generations oftentimes. Well, yes. And um, 
So if we're looking also at the golden age of uh, sitcoms or golden age of TV, which a lot of the uh, mm. baby boomer generation, I'm not saying this in a negative connotation, I'm just saying as it is the baby boomer generation, right, right, those right. born between the years of 1956 and 1967 or something like that. Some, yeah. like, I think a 10 to 15 year range or something like that. Yeah, right, right. Um, you know, the, as they're canonically known, you know, now as boomers, mm. uh, those guys were growing up watching and engaging with these shows and seeing the mm -hmm. you know slice of life kind of shows showing oh you know the dad you know the right. honey i'm home like right. that kind of stuff and, and uh you gotta, you gotta put in there it was it was everybody watching these shows black and white everyone watching it black and white right and i think that where this comes into the uh effects it has on black sitcoms and black mm -hmm. tv in general is because uh oftentimes in america you you we very much so are a meritocracy where it's you right. know success get your success you know if yeah. your father was rich you can be dead broke and if you were if your father was dead broke you can be rich so right, very right. much so like get up and go do it and you know this is where that's the culture that's pushed robust capitalism and all these things that are pushed and shown um and that i think uh that 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 era of tv dominance i right, think right. then sprung up up to create uh, these black sitcoms, and I think it even goes into they things. Kind of mirrored, yes, those, those those values. Because you also have to consider at the time, you know, mm -hmm. the politics of the time is essential to understand in order to yeah. see where the where shows are going. Yeah, because you know the feminist movement, one of the waves, I believe it was a second wave, and the hippie movement and things like that, that was... changed sitcoms. I, I believe because the first wave was suffrage, second wave. Uh, that was, I believe, more so just women's rights on like. A, yeah, it, well, it tied in with uh, uh, suffrage. You know, just like overall, you know, women's rights, suffrage, the, uh, prohibition. That that was all, all first wave. And second wave was, was around like the fifties when uh, women started going to uh, the workplace, and then third, I would say third wave. That was around okay. third wave. But between second and third wave. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. What also, and this, the history is really important, the culture and the current socio-political issues are really important to understand when you see the shows because the same way like Instagram is doing now where it shows the yeah. slice of a perfect life, that's right. what sitcoms were doing. And right, right. out of World War II, you had many things for women that were, you know, increased uh, participation in the labor force, more right. discretionary income, more, you know, political standing and things like right, that right, right. um but then when the gis got back home after um world war ii there was a, a significant regression and suppression of that right. and it was the you know a man comes home his wife's obedient his kids have all their homework done and he comes home and it's right. fine duty day and all day like and so with that like um you you see that slice of time right. and then you see uh how it was changing but that period of prosperity mm. i think strongly influenced not just black sitcoms but black tv in general because mm. you also have to remember that during the suburbanization it was also called white flight yeah and this is in modern america where you see the largest concentrations of mm. black people and all of the gamut, you know, yeah. uh, with discretionary income and jobs and things like that. So you have places like Washington, D.C., formerly known as Chocolate, Chocolate City, sorry. Right, right, right. Um, and then you have New York City and all these things. And with that, you started to see, um, you know, that mm -hmm. at the end of the day, these TV executives, they like they like money. I don't know oh, a do person they? in America that doesn't like money. Yeah. Right. So they see a market that's bubbling and they're mm -hmm. going to support it. Right, and right. there was not really a market... It, because even if you look at the music, yeah. for a, a lot of times when you look at like um, jazz mm -hmm. and blues and things like that, they were either taken and morphed into the white culture or right. whatever. And black yeah, adapted. black music has always been kind of like a sub thing. Right. And when there was popular black music, you know, uh, uh, nationwide, it was oftentimes whitewashed right, and, in exactly. order to get that popularity. There were right, so right, many... Right. Uh, groups. I mean, look at uh, Little Richie versus El uh, Elvis. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, and then, you know, people, do you love me? Do you yeah, exactly. Da, da, do you love, you know. It's very poppy. It's very poppy, especially for the time and things like that. I mean, it's well, still a good ass song, but yeah. I mean, it is. Can you know? <laughs> but uh, you just see how blacks have had to morph for this thing because mm -hmm. I think in large part, 
uh, if you take it down to the Booker T. Washington versus W.E.B. Du Bois, right. one of them was an integration mindset, the other one was the separatist mindset. And I exactly. think that out of that World War II, it was very much so an integration mm. mindset that yeah. was in there. So it was like, well, these white people are doing it and we want to be a part of this. Mm-hmm. How do we demonstrate that we're good and everything like that right, so you have right. shows like soul train you have the growing uh mm. things like funk and stuff like that funk and soul and early r&b right. and so that in the music was already growing so you already have this budding industry with that right. and then now it's like okay well it's the next step or next evolution is right. then black tv and that even calls back to uh, uh and or a topic that i think we're going to kind of go further into especially with more recent examples like uh, a blackish is that want to be accepted mm-hmm. by white America yes and, 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 and as you kind of um, pointed out with you know certain songs and stuff like that you had uh, uh, you know you have the, the, the this kind of sovereign sanctioned uh, uh, pure black media yes you know like for instance you're not going to have that many white folk that you know are going to come up to you quoting good times or yeah. Sanford and Stuns. yeah so you that's that's more of a, a raw media and I, I guess what i'm starting to realize uh through this conversation about the cosby show uh is that was kind of like the transition where it's like okay now let's try to outreach you know to 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 get acceptance uh, uh from white america get that uh, uh get more eyes on us so that we are able to integrate better within the society yes and and that's i mean you got to look at a lot of people at that time were very much so leaning more towards the ideologies of uh, uh w.a du bois or you know martin luther king rather than a malcolm x or booker t washington where they wanted to integrate a lot more and that's why even with the cosby show if you look at the cast and, and you look at the the uh company they kept or the schools they went to it was really diverse, and I believe it would it's more diverse than uh, uh, the Brooklyn area would have been during that time. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, diverse meaning that all these different people are going to the same school, going to the same... Yes, park. because as we know right now, a lot of the public schools are kind of just like uh, it's a race to the bottom where it's just how can you get your kid into a better private school and things like that in Brooklyn and even in DC because a lot of the public schools are struggling and that's where a lot of times just the broke black families would go exactly Um, so yes and I mean also a very 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 essential portion of the influence on black media as a whole including TV and music would Mm be the um, civil rights movement for black Americans yeah. as well as the Black Panther Party mm-hmm. and the uh, uh, I, I guess just the pro-black movement and how right. that shifted things because while it may not be evident immediately in say the Cosby show you definitely right. see elements of it and say things like a different world or yeah. in um, uh, Sister Sister or you have mm-hmm. those more militant and more uh, proud blacks exactly. that would do things differently. And we can get into that a little bit later. Right. And even, what, what would you think, what would you say is the, the legacy of a, a Cosby show, for instance? Well, with the legacy of the Cosby show, if we really look at it, you have, uh, you know, Bill Cosby and his wife, and he was a doctor. She was a, uh, a lawyer, mm-hmm. if we're correct with this. But um, I think that the legacy of it taking all of the BS aside, the current politics with Paul Cosby, I think that it was an example of it can be done. Right, right. And it, it, you know, one very uh, inspirational gentleman I talked to on uh, one of my travels, he was saying, you know, your feet will not take you where your mind has not been. That is true. So if you can see it, Mm -hmm. then you can do it. And I definitely think there are people that grew up watching Cosby Show. And even though it may have been unrealistic at the time to expect that quality of life, they have that imagery in their head and they are fighting for something better. And and, and that is true. Uh, Even though there is... There is something to be said about how uh, realistic it was and how it didn't really show the reality of somebody in that position. I do think that it is good that it allowed uh for a generation of uh young uh blacks you know to look at it and say oh well i could be a doctor it is possible you know i could be a lawyer now uh uh and and uh, one thing that 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 i kind of am weary about when it comes to 
media overall is a lot of times people end up getting uh, disheartened or cynical when they realize, oh man, I gotta do, you know, it's not what it was really portrayed to be. But, but for those who are able to surmount the, the, the challenge and actually overcome it, I think it was a, a, a really good kind of legacy. Mm -hmm. But uh, my critique, if I were to give a critique with that, uh, I would say that you know, it's it's good to work within a medical industry and uh, within law and all these different things and to try to uh, um, better your family, better your uh, situation. Uh, definitely not against that. That's a, a no-brainer. The thing about the Cosby Show is I never saw much outreach with the black community. And and, and look, and, and this is not to say that they had to do that. You mm. know, it's definitely not to say that this is just... Um, you know, just kind of speculating for what the future of black TV could portray. You yes. know, uh, um, uh, they didn't have as much outreach. And so uh, it becomes oftentimes a very kind of individualistic thing where, and of course, like, it's not like, look, you know, I'm very uh, much so against freeload and all these different things, but there wasn't, uh, there wasn't any building of black economics mm -hmm. uh, within the Cosby show. And that would probably be. Um, my main critique when it comes to a show like that is uh, it didn't show, and, and that's not, you know, it's not to say that every show needs a, uh, uh, that, you know, that, that, that righteous agenda, but it, it never showed, from what I can recall, a building of uh, a black economy. And so you're going to have, like, even somebody inspired to be a doctor or a lawyer is going to be within uh, the good old boy system. Yes, they're gonna be trapped within that sphere, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 of course, you know, it's taking a step away from the whole pharma and all these different conversations, just overall, just not being able to branch out and have that sovereignty, you know. Okay, and I think also it'd be uh, useful for our listeners, some of them that don't know the good old boy system, if you could give a little right, bit more right. background. Well, basically, when it comes to the good old boy system, you gotta think uh, from the inception of. I, I, I would say American America, white enterprise. I, I, I want to say America, but I, I mean, overall, it's really kind of a Western thing yeah. where, you know, uh, you had the, and not to, I mean, because it was the white man and the white woman that, 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 that built the West, but particularly when it comes to the white man in the workplace, the workplace was just seen as another form of his uh, uh, outreach, mm -hmm. another manifestation of his space. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes when you go into these workplaces and you see all these white boys, it works in a co in a sort of a fraternal system. The same yes. way that, I mean, uh, as you being a military member, you're the same way as a military or as, um, uh, um, you know, secret societies or frats or, you know, that's why all of them would go and play golf and talk about business or they would all, it was, it, there was a social aspect to it. Your money and your, and your social life were inexpensive explicably linked like yeah. there was no removing them your money and your friends right. where it, it was just a whole right. uh, a whole thing so uh, even another thing to add to that to kind yeah. of build upon the the reality of or the tangibility of the good old boy system was back in those days everybody that worked in a specific area were part of the same community yes and so they all knew each other they all would go out to the stores together their families knew each other mm -hmm. so uh the good old boy system was very much so uh, uh an example of it, it represented the white community in the area and mm -hmm. so when you had uh, uh you know when you have blacks uh trying to penetrate that kind of uh, system that's why there was so much resistance because it's like you're entering into our personal space well an area rife with nepotism and favoritism literally right 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 so you know it was oh so and so is a ceo mm. i really wonder who's gonna be the next ceo back <laughs> in the days you know i really yeah. let's take a real hard look at who's gonna be the next ceo if yeah. it ain't his son because he all, all he had was daughters right. it's gonna be his nephew and that's where nepotism even comes from exactly um, right so 
Yes, and that thing. Um, and also just, let's say you have, you know, Joe Blow, yeah. just this regular guy, um, but, you know, he, he works hard and he mm-hmm. does this and that. It is so much easier for a white person to empathize with that and see themselves in them versus right. a black kid with the same qualifications but a different culture. Exactly. So it's right. so much easier to get the benefit of the doubt and mm-hmm. anything wrong, but it's also so much easier to, to praise when just doing some regular shit. Right, and, 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 and that's something that... If, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of our audience, as well as me and you, have experience on the job. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is where, also a sitcom, uh, I think a central concept to mm-hmm. a sitcom is also the father's work. Yeah. That is very much so the right. father's work. And later things, also the mother's work becomes influential as well. Of course, of course. Um, because, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, that's how he brings home the you know, puts bread on the table. Right, right. And uh, it's also influencing what the son, typically going through his little badass phase and things like that Mm -hmm. and his little struggles, that typically... kind of uh, geared towards. Exactly, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason why so many people were last named Smith. You know, if your father was a blacksmith, you are a blacksmith, your grandkids are going to be blacksmiths. Like, so it's definitely easier to penetrate a job market your father has been in for, you know, half of his life. Right. Uh, So when you have, you know, uh, the quote-unquote good old boy system, Mm -hmm. and that, when we say good old boy system too, I mean, I mean, it does stretch across all of America, but it, I feel like it has a specific tailoring almost to the South. I mean, yeah, we do have to kind of bring that up because we, we are, we're, we're both from Georgia. Yes. So it's one of those things where we, we, we know, you know, coming from being re- born and raised in the deep South, what good old boy means, yeah. you know, but uh, you got to think the whole term good old boy even ties into that, that basis in, uh, I guess, the cornerstone of American values. Yes. You know, so that's where that term good old boy kind of comes in because they, they, they believe in uh, the uh, the philosophies of the founding fathers and, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, their Protestant religion or, you know, what have you. Protestant or Catholicism, depending. Right. Um, well, in the South. In the South, yes, yeah. Protestant, you know, right. Baptist and things like that, yeah. Right, so, so that's where that kind of cornerstone uh, comes in. Any more thoughts on uh, the Cosby Show? Yes. So um, it's also worth noting that, yes, the show is set in Brooklyn, New York, um, mm-hmm. and that was definitely a hub of uh, the black population, right. especially the more visible uh, hub of black population, especially with things like, mm-hmm. you know, the budding genres of funk and soul and later on hip hop. Right, right, um, right. And also uh, you saw a lot of uh, black people going on to achieve very, very, very high, high echelon things. I mean, Obama, right. for example, was going to Columbia in the 80s, I believe. Sure, I, I imagine that was that, that was something else back then. And Columbia was uh, just south of Harlem. Right. So, but you have very notable, very high, high echelon business schools and mm-hmm. uh, medical schools and things like that, like Columbia, NYU. Right, right. Um, so that was just like, if you were going to get it done, whatever the mm-hmm. hell it was, New York was the place to be, especially for a black person, because you couldn't do this in middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Oh, definitely you couldn't not. do this right. in middle of nowhere, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, middle of nowhere, Delaware, or something like that. Right, like, there was a lot of resources available. Yes. Or more resources, I should say, available than most other places. But with it, you also had the, the you know, the sadness of the inner city youth, and the trope mm-hmm. of the inner city youth, uh, especially as crime rates were rising, and eventually the tragedy that was the crack epidemic and things right. like that. Right. But I mean, before that, there was already, you know, problems with prostitution and heroin and cocaine usage anyways. Right, right, right. Uh, it was just kind of like the... The, the Mentos and the Diet Coke kind of thing right, with right, the crack right, epidemic. It, it really just set everything off. It just... Whew. But uh, for The Cosby Show, um, I think it was a very solid framework. Yeah. And le- what you also said earlier about uh, kind of white family with black faces. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, I think that... And, and I really don't want to be disparaging, but you know what I mean? It kind of is what it is. But if we have to just speak to the generic nature of it right. um, and how much uh, a sitcom is expecting to do, because remember at the mm-hmm. time, you know, no one was looking at a sitcom as a real way of, like, this is how we change the viewpoint of Americans. I mean, subconsciously, right. maybe they were probably thinking that. Right, right. But it wasn't... Sitcoms and media at large, I don't think were as much tools of political change as they are now. Right. Back then, it was it was some on TV, you know? Yes. And, 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 and that's even something to kind of, uh, kind of touch on uh, is how it started. You know, they shift from it just being a form of entertainment into it being a form of agenda pushing and, you know, propagating and all these different things. But, you know, we're, we're, we're of course, going to touch base with that a little more uh, throughout this special. 
Yes, and I mean, obviously, the Cosby Show led a legacy so much so that there was even spinoffs of the uh, Cosby yeah, Show. Yeah, which I actually do want to get into next. Okay. Because I, 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 touching on the topic of a certain kind of lifestyle or how the Cosby Show kind of influenced um, black America to reconsider what's what, what, what can be done and uh, what kind of fields uh, uh, could be explored a bit more. I would say that a different world did a very similar thing where, you know, when it was, and, and, and of course, you know, Cosby knew what he was doing when he made a different world, oh, of course. you know, uh, uh, in a benevolent sense, uh, I, I want to yes. point out, uh, he knew what he was doing as far as trying to get more blacks into college. And, yes. um, I, I, I know when it comes to the whole topic of, uh, college then versus college now i mean I, I imagine there was a lot more change a lot of change uh yes and there was a the lot years. of things happening um i mean for one example that i find hilarious was uh with the discussion that cosby was having with the son one day uh mm -hmm. he was saying you know i can't remember his son's name uh I can't. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm there with you yeah uh i feel like my mom would slap me now <laughs> but but um yeah so he was talking to his son and he was, his son was basically like, you know, dad, I don't really want to get a job or anything like that. I don't want to do anything. Yeah. I remember that episode. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, it, I mean, you know, he had a cool head, you know, the straight man is just a cool head. Like right. he's not going to be pissy. Like, and if he is, it's more so kind of justified. Right. right but right. it's more of like a disappointment. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not mad. I'm disappointed. Exactly. <laughs> if, if that's not the straight man's line. <laughs> So, uh, with it, you, he was talking to his son about, you know, you go to school, uh, I'm assuming he was talking about going to be a doctor and things like that for his right, son. Right, right, right. Um, because that very much so is also like a legacy thing. If you were a doctor, mm. your son's more likely going to be a doctor and or then, face pressure to do it. Right. And then also, you know, even with, uh, us trying to integrate within the good old boy system, it's like, oh, you're such and such a son. Yeah. So it was that, that it, it, well. it, it was definitely an in for a little right. bit of nepotism to start. Exactly. Right. So um, the, the penetration of that market. Uh, but he was talking to a son and he was saying, like, you know, when you get your money, you know, you can move to Manhattan when you're younger and then settle down in Brooklyn. Like, yeah. we have to just take a minute to realize, like, what New York was. Like, that was your early childhood. Mm -hmm. That was your lively 20s. That was your work in 30s and 40s. Right. And that was your retirement. Like, New York was this whole ass thing. Hey, that was. And, um... We also got to take a second to realize, too, that, you know, rent prices were different, you know, yeah. and it, it, this was at a time when populations were decreasing mm -hmm. in New York City. Like it was and well, everybody was fleeing. Well, the white people were fleeing and yeah. a lot of the money in those inner city hoods were fleeing. Manhattan, in large part, didn't experience the worst of it. But places like the Bronx and say like Brooklyn. Uh, East, East Brooklyn. Harlem. Yeah, those places were experiencing the worst of it. Um so that also was just like a, a very different view like your whole yeah. life was new york city like right why would you leave like oh, oh you're gonna leave okay are you gonna go to chicago la or miami like that was like <laughs> you know there's four places there's four yeah. other places you're you're gonna go that's yeah you're gonna be comfortable to hear because uh, it's not like we had much safe spaces and uh even when it comes to the whole thing of colleges because um you know, with a show like A Different World, which I, I do commend how it did, uh, it, it first off, it had, it was it was a really good example, I feel, for black youth to kind of, um, you know, want to have an education and expand yes. their minds. You know, that that is one good thing that I think was uh, pushed. But, um, and, 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 and it's kind of sad because <clears throat> there's a certain point where I have to separate um, you know, my opinions on college versus my opinions on uh, education because uh, it, it, you get these two things were conflated oftentimes, you know. And I mean, for a large part of human history, they were, yeah, they're one and the same, they, they were one and the same. But you know, of course, here, you know, things have changed so drastically, especially when it comes to, um, I mean, uh, our community and the HBCUs and all that. But you know, it kind of is a testament to the time. Because, you know, you see a show like A Different World and you see that it's written by uh, Cosby and he viewed college as uh, uh, an out for uh, 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 blacks to have a form of black excellence and then try to expand. But uh, unfortunately, oftentimes, uh, and we still see it to this day, uh, these HBCUs kind of pump out 
Uh, they, 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 they don't, they pump out blacks to be fed into the system rather than, you know, blacks that will separate and build their own enterprise. Yes. Um, but I also think with that, talking for a second on college, I think that white or black, you know, I think college just pumps you out to the system. Oh, of course. It doesn't mean, you know, now the system is white. Yes. But it, it, college is that method of pushing you into the system regardless of what ethnic majority there is in the system exactly so that's also something to be noted for it's not just now if it was uh say uh Mm. uh, somewhere in asia or something like that and this was a majority asian nation and there was you know an opposing ethnic group that was put in the same situation as black americans you know them getting educated would put them into the system um because looking at the histories of colleges i mean you know, we always talk about, you know, money is a new religion and everything because right. we have to talk, you know, on the history of college, too, since colleges had their starts as, you know, places of learning and places of uh, enlightenment. Mm. And it oftentimes had a religious connotation because these were funded right, and, oftentimes. you know, a, a, an arm of the church. And sometimes they're even started in churches. Yes. Yeah. So um, that's where you see that as there's been a, a, a rise in secularism and a rise in people, mm-hmm. you know, separating education from church. Right. Because there are still a lot of Catholic schools. I mean, Georgetown, for example, yeah. is a very old, old, old Catholic school. It's wild to think about. Yes. Um, so taking that and then realizing that the corporations are the new churches, realistically. Right. Yeah. Uh, you see how the, the, the education system went to feed the church back in the day now the education system goes to feed the corporations well i would say i mean of course college uh is kind of a a college could be uh detrimental whether you're black or white but to particularly touch on the cosby show Mm -hmm. the fact that it was an hbcu and or the fact that hbcus were the schools or are still the schools pumping out uh, you know, the black boule and what have you that are going to be fed into the system, I think, truly is uh, the shame in the whole situation. Because um, think about, and it, it, it makes sense because the genesis of a lot of uh, uh, HBCUs was, uh, they were formulated a lot of times by either the founders were white or the funders were white. So it was a way to kind of garner, you know, scrape the top off of uh, black talent and then use the more prominent blacks and have them feed into the system, you know? Well, and yes, what and I mean... On, on, on that? So I guess it's also a, a, an interesting discussion because when it, you talk about black entrepreneurship, yes, mm-hmm. I would say going into and doing your own thing is probably the single best thing you could do uh, on, on a front of... Uh, personal feelings of success as well as um, you know the experiences of hardship and perseverance and you know not and also the experience of ownership and and independence but I also think that that role and that that role that entrepreneurship has to play into society at large but also in black society Mm. I think you know, every person will talk about this. There are there are leaders and there are followers. That is true. And I, I guess what maybe your uh, uh, point of contention would be is that the leaders, the ones that are capable of yeah. running a that's, black that's... entrepreneurial adventure, yeah. those ones are being fed into a system when more realistically they could. And to those, I would say that, yes, um, you know, you have some of the top talent, whether it be... Uh, uh, people that are going to be lawyers, doctors, and things like that—the ones yeah. that have the the mental gall to be able to accomplish these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also think it's a it's a question of risk tolerance. That I mean that 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 definitely is true. I mean that is true, but I mean kind of goes to show certain I, I guess morals that weren't really uh, captured, unfortunately, uh, or weren't really pushed onto us as mm-hmm. far as being able to take a risk. And uh, cause here, here's the thing. For instance, with, let's say somebody goes and becomes a lawyer. Mm-hmm. You know, they went to um, uh, Howard, for mm-hmm. instance, to, to uh, become a lawyer. Now, they have their law degree, and now they're able to work at a firm. Yes. The thing about it is, instead of opening up a law firm, let's say they go back to Harlem and open up a law firm so that 
you know, uh, uh, blacks that have issues with uh, bail, the law, I mean, just the law in general, mm-hmm. are able to kind of go and, and, and have somebody in the, the, in the core of the neighborhood to go to. Instead of doing that, they were absorbed into the greater society. And so the, not only is, um, not only is there no, nothing ventured and nothing earned as far as, you know, they didn't open up their own law firm and then have a certain uh, brick that could be used uh, uh, on the foundation of the black, uh, of black uh, uh, economics, mm-hmm. they also, their efforts are kind of absorbed into the greater society. You know, which I, that, that's, that's my main thing when it comes to that aspect because it's, 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 you know, it's one thing if it's like a few people, but it's like so many people fight so hard to get into HBCU and the efforts are, aren't, aren't brought back to us, you know, and, 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 and I'm, I'm saying this comparing it to, for instance, the Hispanic community. Uh, I think that, did I show you the magazines? Um, I'm not really sure, no. Well, I, I know uh, I, I know I showed it on uh, the Black Narrative on one of our uh, broadcasts. I actually found a magazine um, from uh, uh, I think it was I found a magazine. You know where they have those uh, where you're able to kind of pull and and get uh, like a magazine or a newspaper. But it was one of their uh, one of their. Uh, not like post. A, okay, yeah. I, I don't know, I don't know like job name. postings or whatever. I'm guessing I see where this is going. Is it talking about like abogados para ti, things like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. Exactly. Accidente de auto, you know. Yeah, all that, exactly. Okay. And so I'm looking in it, and gosh, I wish I had the thing with me, but I was looking inside of it, and not only did it have postings for various uh, uh, lawyers, mind you, this is, it was speaking to the immigrant population Yes. Like people that are just like fresh off the, the fresh boat. off the boat, most or, definitely. I mean, you know, fresh over the border. Maybe fresh over the border, <laughs> exactly. Actually, a FOB, fresh off the boat, or fresh over the border. Yeah, it FOB. Yeah, <laughs> the, the FOB. <laughs> but um, it was speaking to people who were fresh over the border and didn't even really know English. Yes. You know, and and not only did it show the lawyers, yes. it showed also how to find a good lawyer. And I was reading; it was really good tips. You know how to find a good lawyer, how to get. Um, how to get your own uh, 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 mortgage. You know, they were offering services on how to acquire a mortgage with no with no uh, social security, mm-hmm. with no uh, 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 credit base, uh, uh, credit score. Mm-hmm. Like they were showing all these different things and I'm like, yo, where is that for us? And so given that comparison, that's where I feel it's really like a shame when it comes to, uh, 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 I mean, let's, let's try to tie it back into media. When it comes to this portrayal of, uh, uh, and, and of course, it comes from, you got to understand the generational difference as well. This is what uh, uh, the past generations believed in uh, when it came to education, everything like that. That's why a show like A Different World did come about. Yes. Because they believe that this is how you elevate the black community is through uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, bundle of education, which is, you know, college. Mm-hmm. You know, you get the education, you get the job, you get everything. It was seen as a bundle. Well, and the fraternities. The fraternities, too. And, and for, Oh, that's a whole different topic. Yes. Could, yeah, that's a whole different topic we could um, uh, possibly touch on. But, but I mean, with the bundle. Yeah, the fraternity, let's throw that in the bundle as well. You know, the, the socializing, all these different things. It was seen as a bundle. Mm-hmm. But what came from that bundle? You know, because here you have... You know, educated, uh, uh, you know, a show that portrays uh, black education and, you know, speaking on the legacy of a different world, a lot of people, a lot of blacks did want to enter college after that show, which, you know, uh, uh, could have been good depending on where which uh, career path they went to, could have been uh, poor. But, I mean, now we see the after effects uh, uh, of black education, college education, you know, because it wasn't just... Uh, 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 it wasn't, it became not something you did for a practical reason. It became something you did because it, it was almost like a, I mean, it was almost like a social event. And so now you have um, certain individuals that instead of going into masonry or into plumbing or into uh, engineering or what have you, mm-hmm. you know, they went to college, you know, and, and got an English degree. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't even recall the different degrees they had in a different world. You know, uh, what they were going for. Yeah. So you have that kind of uh, legacy that's been left behind. And 
I truly think the shame is that is we did not build any base because how is it you have all these educated brothers and sisters that went into these HBCUs, got their degrees, got jobs, you know, got uh, uh, six figure incomes. Mm -hmm. And yet somebody that just crossed the border, you know, from, you know, just hopped over from Mexico to Arizona. Now they're getting a freaking mortgage. Yeah. You know, um, and I mean, that just speaks on to a large thing uh, as a whole. I mean, you know, when you talk about the decades and almost centuries of also the, the right. Mexican-American struggle as well. Um, right. And also in large part, I mean, as far as ethnic groups, the Hispanic, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, Spanish-speaking uh, ethnic group, they uh, are in the same boat a lot of, in a lot of different statistics uh, with mm. black Americans. Um, but as far as the examples of, yes, like uh, the lawyers for you right. or just a support system overall, I mean, we also can get into the nuance of the fact that they are literally speaking a different language. So that is a very insular right. thing where it's like you can't even talk to these white people if you wanted to. Right. That, that is true. But I mean, that's what every uh, uh, immigrant group does. You know, they and, have, but they also have a different language. Yeah, I mean that that is that is true. I mean, even think about the Irish. Um. Yes, and that I mean that also comes from. And I was even talking to a a, a person at work about this actually. Mm. When it came to uh, how you have, say, uh, the uh, like Eastern European hoods, right. or you have like black hoods, or you have Hispanic hoods. Right. Uh, the Jewish and the Irish, they are you know canonically white, right, but right. they aren't viewed as Anglo-Saxon or Western European right, in, right, that, right. in that same way. So what they are having is kind of their own struggle or their own hustle, you know, with the Jewish getting into uh, uh, finance and other uh, law. law and other you know large institutions and with the Irish more so getting into a, a, a more blue collar right. such as firefighters or policemen mm -hmm. uh, or plumbers kind of thing. Right. Uh, so with it, I mean, we're talking on like humongous black issues yeah. that are we're seeing only through a porthole of the uh, mm -hmm. these TV shows. And the reason, folks, why we're talking so uh so deeply about college is because as these shows progress, college becomes an ever increasing presence in these right, shows. Right, times, right. So it's just giving a background, giving the contentions and right. the current issues and how that relates because right. it will go into shows like Grownish mm -hmm. and Blackish and how mm -hmm. that thing, especially with even like Sister Sister and stuff, uh, because, yeah, college becomes a more central part. When I was saying earlier, like, right, right. your job, the, the father's job was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I think that now the education and the college is really what's kind of uh, right. has a, a, a magnifying glass on it. And, and here's where uh, uh, I, I will say that I, 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 I do disagree to a degree when it comes to, like, Mexican-Americans and other immigrant groups being in exactly the same uh, boat as uh, blacks in America. Because um, you have the difference where they still, you're, you're, uh, there's less of a fail rate because they're so insular. You know, of course, there's a language, you know, uh, uh, barrier and all these different things, but they have a certain support of each other that uh, uh, you don't see in the black community. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's not just uh, uh, an external thing. It's also an internal th thing that, uh, uh, and, and, and this truly, this conversation is more of an internal conversation, I, I guess uh, um, I would say, mm -hmm. because the internal kind of responsibility, we don't impose a responsibility on each other to say, okay, well, you know, when you, like, you don't, you don't gotta help out every single individual with the same skin color as you. You know what I mean? Because you're going to have, of course, like any other community, you have uh, people in our community that will use uh, 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 others of our community. But, you know, you come and you build with other people of your uh, uh, color, of your background, and try to build up the community at hand so that you, we have less of a fail rate. When you look into the Hispanic community, you see less of a just flat out just fail rate you know, amongst them, because there is a level of support. Now, you're still going to have poverty, you're still going to have struggle, and you're still going to have issues, but there's less of a just, you're going to be washed out, and your community taken over, and your neighborhood's going to be gone, you know, right, compared to us, of course. 
Yeah. Um, and as far as keeping things internal, I mean, it, it definitely is an issue. And this kind of is like a, the same thing with economics and politics, because, yeah. you know, for any politician that wants to enact serious change, mm -hmm. there's going to be some ugly things that have to happen. And the problem is that, you know, in a, in a four year span, you have people ready to just say you're fucking up in any way possible. Right. So if you're trying to do in the case of Obama with Medicare or whatever, yeah. I'm not saying it would have worked or wouldn't have worked, but right, right, with right. just so much opposition and so many people ready to look at him and laugh when any misstep happens. Right, right, right. It, 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 I, I guess there's the importance of, you know, America or black America is still reeling from the consequences of the crack epidemic. They're still right. reeling from the inner city crime. And mm -hmm. in large part, looking now that I live in D.C. and um, getting more of a snapshot into, you know, Baltimore, seeing how bad it is mm -hmm. in these areas and how much actual poverty is in these cities. Right, right. And these are really and truly i mean dc is not as black as it was but it's still mm -hmm. like in a demonstrably high percentage black right, right, right um and the same with baltimore and the same with detroit so it's it's that attacking of the the culture because i do think that there is definitely negative aspects of our culture that right, i do right, not right. really care for and it's yes how much external pressure is mm. perpetuating that you know with payday loans and loan sharking right. and you know dealers drug dealers and all that stuff like right. how much that is causing a negative effect but also um and you and i have talked about this even you know just getting access to that one percent of blacks and getting them to do some right. shit. oh well, most definitely uh in the future and, and, and this is uh something that i've even you know, spoke on on the broadcast when it comes to the B1 community. Mm -hmm. It's like, we have to understand that we are a minority. Yes. Within the black community, yes. B1 people are a minority no matter what plot of land you're on. Yes. You know, and so that's something that does have to be considered. So, but the thing about, you know, a base, you know, the corner stone, the stone is one stone, mm -hmm. you know, and there wasn't even that effort to build the cornerstone, mm -hmm. you know, and that's uh, the main thing. And because, I mean, heck, even when you look at the uh, percentage of our, you know, community that would be able to go to college and would be able to get these jobs, of course, it's a small percent. You know, we're 1% of the 1% uh, as that, that, that figure goes. But it's not like... Black, there are 1% of the top 1% is black. Exactly. Yes. Right. Uh, but it's still one of those things where that's not coming back. You know what I mean? That's not coming back to, to, to rebuild. So, yeah, there's a lot, and, and we definitely uh, uh, know that there there's a lot of um, issues with, within our community, but uh, there's a lot of issues within every, you know, immigrant uh, community that you see, mm -hmm. but they still build their cornerstones, you know, and, and, and those that, that fall by the wayside, I mean, like, like, and that's another thing to kind of get into. And, and, and I don't want to get too much into uh, this aspect, this next aspect I'm going to uh, uh, bring up since we are, I do have other things we want to cover. But um, that is another thing that I do want to kind of touch on is the fact that we, we, we don't have the same moral codes as other communities even. You know, like um, think about the Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. You might have a lot of issues, but they still have a, a Catholic base. They still have Very a, much so. Talking know, with more Hispanic people and even going to a Hispanic wedding, right. the Catholicism is strong. And they will not, uh, 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 they will not, they won't think twice to ostracize you. Mm -hmm. You know, they won't think twice to just, you know, shun you. And that's with all these other communities is they won't, you know, they, 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 they won't, uh, 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 have any qualms or scruples about shunning you, but with us, we want to invite everybody to the barbecue. So, yeah, I, I definitely think that you have a, a point when it comes to, uh, you know, black people want to invite everyone to the barbecue, so to speak, right, and right. the immigrant groups of other nations and other ethnicities have a different, um, a completely different uh, kind of moral standard when it comes to those kind of things, right? Yes, and if I may be honest for a second, man, I think that we could talk at agnosium about all of these yeah most um definitely. but i think that we did give a solid base uh, uh yeah. to, to reflect where our mindsets are so that we can then move into discussions about these black tv shows and and honestly that the whole morality thing i think is a really good segue because the next topic i want to bring up is bet yes and its effect on uh uh black entertainment and uh oh my gosh uh how how much it's um uh, kind of demoralize how we're viewed not only by ourselves but also by you know uh, uh just 
not not only by ourselves, but how we wanted to portray ourselves. Because I, I even think um, that a show like uh, The Boondocks kind of touched on it, which I mean, we could get into a little, we're going to get into The Boondocks a little later. Yeah. Uh, how much BET was just a detriment to us and, and, and just always portrayed us in a, a, a negative way. Because, I mean, before, I mean, of course, BET is a bit older, but oftentimes you remember a lot of messy, look, like, I'll say this. If BET was still as prominent, and I'm pretty sure it, it, it was, at a, it probably still is to a degree, do, do you th- doesn't Empire strike you as a BET show? Uh, it definitely, and this is also us talking out of ignorance since we don't really, you know, watch much TV anymore. Right, yeah, 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 because, I mean, it's not like we watch live cable like yeah. that anymore. But um, just kind of going back to reminisce, yeah. uh, uh, a show like... Uh, Empire. Uh, Empire would be a BET show, and BET really did showcase a lot of. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, black dramas, but they weren't. They they were. There was a lot of toxic aspects to these various uh, black dramas, and uh, even when toxic relationships, to, toxic right. ways they were treating their employees if they did have yeah. black enterprise, toxic relations with the white community, and things right. like that. Um, so yeah, it's most definitely it. It I think that the overall. Uh, kind of aura that I could uh, uh, ascertain would be just pain. Yeah. Pain. and When it comes to BET. Yeah, and uh, I would say a largely negative reaction to that pain. Um, yeah. Because you have, like, you know, there, there's the joke that you don't join the military if your life is going good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, most of. And, you know, you, you don't... And that's also another thing, too, when it comes to even drug addiction. Yeah. Something as self-destructive as a drug addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to, and I, uh, there's been a lot of research and a lot of stuff, but for these mm-hmm. very self-destructive drugs, a lot of times it's not really even the drug. And I'm not, I'm speaking on the bleeding edge of science here. I'm just trying to kind of get a general. Right, right, right. This is kind of a fringe, you know, some on the fringes. Yeah, something on the fringes, and I'm in no way a medical expert. I'm just, you know, anecdotal slash, uh, you know, just what I hear Research through things. and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it seems that uh, a large problem when it comes to the drug addiction mm. is the environment that person is in. Right. Because a lot of people, and I've heard many stories of people getting effortlessly, not effortless, but with a lot less effort than they anticipated getting clean in prison, to then right, get out right. and have struggles with that drug addiction. So mm. I, I would say that it, it it's an issue for BET and things like that. It's, it's the culture and it is that mm. misery loves company. Yeah kind of aspect and I mean also talking about lowbrow you know highbrow versus lowbrow content right, right. Um, you know lowbrow content appeals to mm-hmm. you know our ooga booga brain it, yeah, it exactly. appeals to our desires for you know um, coitus and pleasure and things like right, that right. Uh, and you know our uh, even American capitalist views of just making money and you know yeah. power moves on people and you know calling you know flicks on people and all that yeah. stuff like it, it, which is funny um because uh uh you know BT uh, uh it, it's, it's it's an older it's it's definitely before our time when it was was first aired you know but uh to kind of get into the whole you know chicken or the egg uh, discussion you really did see on Front Street. A display of the most negative aspects of our culture. Yes. In the most, like, this was probably the highest degree that I think has been shown in the media. I think, I, I and of course, you know, in a generation, in a generation. But I, I and I want to put this out there because this is a conversation, you know, and this is you know for all the audience and anybody that wants to chime in. It almost seems like BET opened the door for that level of degeneracy to be showcased and, and not only showcased, but even celebrated because we were all young once. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was a kid, I loved 106 and Park. Mm-hmm. I would sneak and watch 106 and Park. Now my folks say, why are we watching 106 and Park? Because we, we all know what was on it. Mm-hmm. But you were drawn to that kind of uh, 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 image. And not only that, the 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 kind of prominence that uh, uh, these rappers were being given, and uh, uh, you know the vixens that they were around, and the money, and all these different things, it really just hacked into your young mind to think, oh, that is success. 
You see how much they're talking about him? They have interviews and all that. And now I even think how that relates to uh, yeah. the Cosby Show and how it relates to even music. Because black mm -hmm. music, you know, a, a big critique of the funk and the soul uh, and a lot of these things was that it was giving an unrealistic image of what the black community was experiencing. Right. And it was Most giving, uh, uh, for some people, a very unattainable uh, goal standard. Right. And, you know, uh, I think that... It's almost like that thing of uh, how a lot of R and B star stars, a lot of R and B stars that made these love songs have horrible relationships. Well, yes, that too. <laughs> you know. Um, so, and then when you look at the explosion of rap uh, in the '90s, which was the golden age of hip hop, right. and you look at Nas and Biggie and them artfully and skillfully discussing the reality of the situation, right, I right. think that while I do love that, I think that it also opened the door for a lot of BS. For a lot of true. lowbrow content, because I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, Biggie was talking about hitting licks, talking about yeah. traffic and all the way to Virginia and stuff like that. Right. Nas was talking about you know selling and all that, exactly. and growing up in the hood. And it there was it, to be quite frank, there was a certain uh, glorification of these and things. That glorification and the mafioso kind of thing, especially right. with New York, especially with New York and Jay Z and all of them. Jay Z, Biggie. Uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, I mean, Junior Mafia overall. Yeah. You know, Puff. Like, there was, there was definitely that mindset of uh, that mimicking of the mob. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, maybe a significant casualty is mm -hmm. in that revulsion of the Cosby show or these unrealistic e d demonstrations of black life and TV, right. we then are trying to, to, more so in music, show the reality or an mm -hmm. exaggeration of this reality and things and people being right. so happy to be so ratchet you yeah. know with the saliti meal and everything and stuff like that my gosh yeah and and, and well i would say th that when you talk uh, talking about the realm of black music which of course is another uh form of media that we're very prominent in that definitely is true the thing about it with 106 and park i remember oftentimes it was usually like uh <laughs> For some reason, one song uh, 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 that that keeps coming to my mind when I think of 106 at Park is um, I forgot who it was, but but um, uh, shout at you, my medicine. Like for some reason, that song comes to my mind, and, and like it was a lot of songs like that where they were talking about you know it was just sex, drugs, and 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 partying, you know, and very rarely did you see a song like. Uh, like like Ludacris' Runaway Love. You know, I mean, it might you might have seen it on 106 at Park. Yeah. But it was sandwiched in between a lot of other myths. Mm hmm You know, so so really BET just put our dirty laundry in the front street. And, and it's one thing to, you know, have, you know, these issues out there and to have a conversation about them. It didn't have a conversation about them. It said like it, it showed it showed it glorified. It, 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 a lot. I feel like a lot of uh, kind of that hood rich culture was kind of promoted and propagated with. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know what? I'll say solidified. BT solidified that 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 want to be hood rich. Well, what what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I would say I have to agree because, you know, there's a difference between, you know, wealth and being hood rich. You know, people like, I mean, how fucking my neighbors, sorry, my neighbors, uh, uh, my bad folks, uh, <laughs> but my neighbors, it's like, I see people, you know, they got wads of cash up in their pants, right. pants sagging and everything, and their car sounds busted as all hell, but it's... Yeah. And it's a beamer, but it's like that's hood rich, you know. Right, it, right, right. It, it, it's it's I got enough money to do all this, and I'll be going to McDonald's with a Louis Vuitton, you know, belt right. and stuff like that. So that we can flex on each other. Yeah, and you know, I I'm just starting to see hood rich in these cities because you know, um, in Metro Atlanta specifically, uh, uh, especially our side of town. Yeah. It the hood rich, you know it. The wealth, you know, you have rappers like the Migos and all them, but right. when it comes to the real, real, like, holy crap, holy, like, this is, uh, you know, you're making thousands and thousands of dollars, yeah. you know, what we would tri typically attribute to, like, drug money. Right. I, I didn't see that until I got to D.C. and even went into deeper parts of Atlanta. Right. Um, so, and yeah, it's like you're talking about the solidification. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely think it, it played a part. And um, yeah, I'm actually going to jump around with topics a bit because the fact, now that we're on the topic of BET, the last time I actually saw it, I, how, how long has it been for you since you've uh, laid eyes on BET? Probably half a decade. Well, recently, 
uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, I was at somebody's, uh, uh, I was at a family member's home and I saw, you know, they had BET on. So, you know, I sat and I looked at it because I'm curious. I'm always curious to see what, you know, what's going on with cable and what people are uh, engaged in. Most definitely. BET now is, and this is just, I feel like this is almost like uh, uh, if, if, if you were to have a, a, a little poisonous spiked caterpillar turn into a, a, a venomous butterfly, this is the transformation. BET now is the Tyler Perry Network. Man, you know, you know that dude has about. Oh my gosh, man! It, I, and I'm not exaggerating. Like maybe eight shows on it. I'm not exaggerating. Mm. They seem like every commercial break, every other commercial was for one of his shows. So I even want to touch on Tyler Perry and his effect on the black community and how we uh, perceive. Uh, I mean relationships and all these different things and uh, uh, and like how that kind of ties into the degeneracy that started with BET because I, I I think that's the match made in hell BET and Tyler Perry. <laughs> Uh, I'm just thinking about like, would you rather be a servant in heaven or a king in hell? Because he sounds like he is all up and down that. Boy, like, he is running it. Man, he he is he is the emperor. <laughs> Boy, seriously. Okay. So what what are your thoughts as far as uh, that goes? Well, with Tyler Perry, I mean, in the obvious, you know, weird things such as his obsession with Medea and getting the wrong address. <laughs> like, right. That's that's obviously a weird thing. Mm-hmm. I always used to see. The Medea this, Medea that, and I'm like, you really sure do seem to kind of enjoy that. Yeah, he's very drawn to that character. He uses it every chance he gets. Because um, I'm thinking like, look, I mean, I'm sure it's a lick. Like you get some money off of it, but I'm like, right. you really enjoy this. Like you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I even want to touch on because uh, you know, growing up in Atlanta, you know, you remember Peachtree TV. Yes. It just goes to show just how uh, how much of a hold on the culture that he had, especially in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes when you had these uh, family shows, I, I um, yeah, like Meet the Brown and um, what was the other House of Pain those kind of things and I mean you know, one of them might have been good every once in a while but yeah. I just feel like he uh, he he went out of his way to portray things in such a I mean first off it was very stereotypical uh, way but also there was a lot of messy a lot of messy stuff in his uh, movies have you ever had a chance to sit down and watch like Outside of the Medea movies, like his earlier work. Um, if I was watching, it, it was probably because my mom made me, or was watching it, and I was just trying to get up under her and be like, "Mom, mom, mom," like that right. kind of stuff. Yeah. But Well, it was a lot of um, and 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 I I I really am curious about other people's thoughts on this because I I am speaking from the view from, I mean, as as somebody that's just kind of disgusted by Tyler Perry and his work, but. To me, it really kind of, it seemed like every movie pushed this kind of um, battered woman, you know, uh, 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 get saved uh, um, mentality, the saved kind of storyline. Honestly, if I'm being if I'm being truthful for a second, like, because uh, at my job we actually have had a, an opportunity to watch a little bit of TV, yeah. and I, I I got to catch up on some really just funny, hilarious shows like. Yeah. Uh, uh, South Park specifically, I got to catch yeah. up on that. But in that, I saw ads for the Hallmark Channel, and the Hallmark Channel pushes—I yeah. would honestly say—a white version of that. Uh, yeah. That battered woman saved kind of thing. Like Lifetime Movie Network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you know, thing, and and it's not to take away from you know the the amount of people that that does happen to. Mm-hmm. But with him, it was always just. One thing, one thing, one theme that I always saw uh, in these different films was like the demonization of black men, mm-hmm. you know, because it was always, you know, black man, like, like there was never any responsibility on both sides. Oftentimes, it was just, you know, you'd have this horrible, this brute, you know, and he was, you know, rich and had all these different, you know, riddled with insecurities and would just be just absolutely horrible, mm-hmm. you know, and like that, that, that whole thing, man. Like I, I wish I had more to 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 offer on that, but I mean, it's just I feel like with Tyler Perry is just so brass tacks what the the problems are uh, in his movies because it's a skewed kind of perception of uh, black romance, mm-hmm. uh, black love, and also it's it's always this, you know where where's a movie 
where it's just you know two 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 adults that that, that have made good choices in life come together and uh, 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 you know have a genuine romance. It was always this you know this sister she mm-hmm. she she had several kids you know with uh, somebody that was a deadbeat or somebody that was a, a, a wicked man. And then, you know, it was uh, a guy that had all his stuff together. He was, um, you know, he would have six figures or what have you. He might have his own uh, uh, kids, you know, kids from his past uh, 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 marriages or what have you. And, you know, she's trying to escape from this horrible uh, uh, man that she's dealing with. And he's the one to come save her. And it's like, it's not, to me, that's not healthy, you know. And it's not healthy to kind of put in the minds of uh, uh, sisters that, that there's always going to be somebody to save you. Well, and this is also where we start talking about the morality of TV because at the yeah. end of the day, you know, when it who's gonna, it, when there's a dollar involved, someone's Boy, gonna tell you want. Right. T- when there's a dollar involved, someone's gonna tell you what you want to hear versus what you need to hear. Exactly. And there is no morality in TV. They just you know, just whatever sells. Mm. So that's where you. I, I think that kind of falls into like. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a a section of books called mommy novels. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, Fabio being a very large central yeah. poster guy of that. Uh, but when you're talking about, um, I, I think that also kind of falls in the realm of like mommy TV, where right, yeah. it, it, it is definitely a, a, a form of escapism. The same way that for right. you and I, it could be listening to excessively ratchet music just for the fun, um, just kind of in that catharsis of just getting to explore you know your deepest id your deepest right, right, desires because right. for men obviously it's different you know it's money fame power things like that right, right, right. more so for us less fame but more money and pa- money and power definitely right, right, right. uh and i think that for the the what i would even call it mommy tv like mm. it, it, it scratches a certain itch that, that is true and there there i cannot argue that there's not an audience for it because if it was not an audience for it tyler perry would not be where he is now he's a billionaire right I'm a uh, billionaire. I'm not sure about it. He's, he's got to be. Sure as hell, is a millionaire. He's loaded, bro. But he has to be. I, look, I'm not gonna lie. Like, like, you guys pretend like we're all fair. I'm not gonna lie. I, I, I feel like the dude might be a billionaire. He has a whole entire house in Atlanta where he, he fills his movies. I mean, he had a replica of the freaking um, of uh, of the White House for one of his. Yes, man. He has a fr- he has a show coming out about like a president, you know, like a black president and it's a scandal. Like, imagine. Imagine like scandal meets Obama's presidency, <laughs> you know. It like it's like what are we, what are we doing here? Yeah. My gosh, but um, but yeah, there definitely is an audience for it. I can't um argue against that. The issue when it comes to that though is the fact that we prop, not us personally, not but a lot of people prop up Tyler Perry and his work, when I, <laughs> I really cannot think of many movies that he did that was like. Oh, like now this is something that the black community needs to watch because, it, and you know what, you know what it is too, and and and, and, and I feel like this isn't something that I have written down, but it kind of plays into that whole thing of trauma-based black television, yeah, where it just feeds into this deep trauma that the black community has, and that's what draws people in, because mm-hmm. a lot of Tyler Perry films are trauma-based. You know, because you have these people in very unfortunate situations, very just compromised. And it, I mean, in certain cases, it does speak to what the black community is going through. But I, I me personally, I'm not a big fan of just this, uh, this trauma play that, mm-hmm. that, that we oftentimes do or look for in media. Oh, of course. Um, and yeah. Even uh, when it comes to like slave movies and stuff like that. Yes. Um, and I mean, obviously, the whole movie industry and black movies is a whole thing in and of itself. Uh, right. But do you think it would be also useful to switch gears more so to, I guess, what we were originally discussing, which was the sitcoms? Because, yes, Tyler Perry and also just contemporary mm-hmm. black TV in the non sitcom sense obviously right. is a whole rabbit hole in and of itself. Yeah. Well, what I think would be better and you know what i'm gonna say i'm gonna say my thoughts for when we talk about the future okay but, cool but but uh uh true truly it does kind of play into that whole trauma play you mm-hmm. know and and and, and it even I, and it's a weird synergy mm-hmm. between this kind of traumatic uh, uh film industry that that tyler perry feeds into and the glorification of uh uh uh, uh that trauma 
there's there's a certain glorification of it, I I guess to a degree, but also um, BET, what BET does when it comes to glorifying the negative aspects of our culture, mm-hmm. and I, and I th- you know what, now I feel like I can really kind of articulate what my issue is with Tyler Perry. It's this kind of glorification of negative, uh, him and BET, they both glorify just negative aspects of our culture, and now whenever people think of black film, a black director, black writer, black they think of Tyler Perry. And I'm going to make a statement here. I believe the fact that somebody like a Tyler Perry is able to uh, 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 get to the level he is really kind of shows where we are as a people, you know, uh, uh, in our relationship with media. I mean, in a metaphorical sense, if you look at a society, the tallest building often represents their values. And in right. Western Europe and oftentimes South America, for centuries, the tallest buildings were... Uh, cathedrals or uh, right. church places of worship, but or now even like Rio de Janeiro, the Christ statue. Yeah, but now if we look at it, say a prominent example in LA, I believe it's a, an insurance building or a bank building. I can't remember. Right. But it shows you. It's like at the end of the day, that's that's mm-hmm. what it's about. And if we take it metaphorically, the largest and most prominent players in the black media sphere, that right. kind of shows you what is rewarded or what right. what, what, what we people care towards. about. Yeah. Right. And 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 and. and I, I definitely have to bring that up because uh, we have to bring that up because uh, we have to kind of change what we mentally consume, you mm-hmm. know. Because what you consume, you become what you consume. The same way that your men- your physical diet could affect your uh, uh, body, the same way your mental diet could definitely uh, uh, affect you as well. So I, I do want to go ahead and uh, take this time to kind of transition into. Um, if we could touch on the fresh pitch of uh, Bel Air, first off, did you hear about the reboot? Yes, I heard about the reboot, um, and I heard it's being produced by Will Smith. Now I'm not sure what's going to happen to that after the whole situation mm-hmm. with uh, Jada Pinkett and him, right? Ain't that convenient? And uh, Chris Rock, but um, yes, I mean obviously for the younger viewers that haven't seen uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, yeah, uh, it, it's going to be a, a drama from what I gather, instead of insane. a sitcom. Yeah. Because by very nature of it, it, it is a serious situation, but I like the angle of them taking a serious situation and making it more lighthearted. Exactly. I, I mean, you know, Which in... a lot of black TV shows did back then. Yeah. In West Philadelphia, born and raised. Like... Yeah, <laughs> my whole thing is, like, with the intro alone, you know I mean? It kind of... When they said they were going to dramatize it, I thought that was absolutely just insane. Because from the intro alone, it's just like, you can tell it's a sitcom. Well, and I mean, I think that also the reason why the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air had that intro, and it uh, kind of, not trivialized, but it kind of was like, you get the gist. Yeah, we of have, course. Because so many black Americans, that was the reality. In West right. Philadelphia, born and raised on the playgrounds where I spent most of my days. Right. You know, started college trouble in the neighborhood. You know, like, mm. that, that was the reality so it's kind of like we can gloss over it we already know what it is yes and now let's do the real crazy thing which is the premise of the show of going to your rich uncle's house right and you know living a completely different life for the majority of black americans that was like whoa which i I do like that i do like that kind of um juxtaposition of you know his west philadelphia background and him going out to live in uh uh, bel-air or it was california bel-air california yeah and i I, and this is where um you know akis himself even wanted to talk with me a little bit more about it because i Mm -hmm. i so fervently research things and yeah when it comes to economics i think it would be interesting to touch on it to touch on as far as when it comes to uh just how prominent his uncle was uncle phil was loaded yes and uh it's important to know uh how these people came into their wealth and things like that for a lot of uh our Mm -hmm. viewers i'm sure you're aware of the grind that is becoming a lawyer or a doctor right right. um and but we can also touch on in later examples such as Mm -hmm. blackish the pitfalls yeah um most definitely so in uncle phil's case he was what we'd call a partner at a law firm so with a law firm we also have to remember that uh, this is the trajectory. I mean, Uncle Phil, we obviously see him. He's, you know, bald and with a gray beard. He's, you yeah. know, an older, established, portly man. Right. Um, and not without success, obviously. Most if. So we have to kind of... He's been eating good. <laughs> most definitely. 
Um, so when we look at an example of an Uncle Phil, uh, mm. uh, I really wanted to figure out, you know, even when I was younger, how do I become an Uncle Phil? Right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, Will Smith was a cool, little funky, cool character, but I'm not going to lie, both of us were kind of lame. Both of us were not, right. you know, as we say, ladies' men back in the day. Right, right, right. So it... I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, he's the cool, suave character. I don't care about him. I care about Uncle Phil. And I right. even also cared about, like, Carlton. What was he going to do? Because he was trying to follow mm -hmm. in his father's footsteps. Right. So, with it, um, you would have to, obviously, do good in high school. Most definitely. yeah. And for a lot of black Americans, it's already a very difficult thing to graduate high school. And not only graduate high school, but do well in high school. You're right, talking right, high right. GPA. Uh, and so, we're talking about a high GPA in high school. And... From that, you would then need to be accepted into uh, a decently prestigious... Right, like uh, law school. No. Really? Decently prestigious university. Mm -hmm. You can go to law school without a bachelor's, but very seldom does that happen. Ah, uh, okay, step, steps. Right. Yes. So you would need to do good in high school. And also, we're talking about, you know, not only the, the, the firm things of a GPA, right. but also to get into a good college you would need to have really good extracurriculars. It would be, I need to see your first or second chair on violin and the orchestra, right. or you were an all-star athlete. You know, not you don't have to be, you know, uh, like the best, but right. uh, it would help if you had a good enough uh, athletic ability to where you could play college, college football or basketball or something like that. Notable. Notable. Right. So you had to be not only a scholar mm. to be good in high school, but you also had to have other skills, you know, a leader in the clubs, a right. leader in this or in the chess team or something. So you had to be a very well-rounded, astute and studious person person mm -hmm. that also was you know embodying really and truly what college meant right. uh, where it was well-rounded um so for that you would then go to a prestigious uh, uh college right. or you could go to a mid-tier college and still go to a very high tier um mm -hmm. uh, law school it would just be a little harder but right, right, right. so you would go to these colleges and for these people they would typically uh major in something like english mm -hmm. or philosophy or um, a few other majors, yeah. because the most important thing besides your GPA in college for getting into a law school is your yeah. LSAT. Oh, yeah. Because for high schoolers, it's the SAT. And I remember yeah. when I was graduating around the time they switched from the 2400-based system to the 1600-based, uh, back to the 1600-based. Mm -hmm. I think I got like an 1100 or something like that. Nothing great. 1100 out of 1600. Yeah. Uh, T and Tamara, remember, one of them yeah. got like a 15-something and one got like a 10-something. Yeah. You know, uh, which one got the lower one? Uh, it was Tamara. So Tamara, she got like a 10 something, I got like an 1150. Right. So I'm kind of floating around Tamara's uh, mm -hmm. intelligence, which by no means was bad. I mean, I was probably in like the, the uh, I can't remember now, is it? I can't even remember my score. Yeah, it was a while ago. I just yeah. remember it was burned in my head. I think like an 1150, maybe coming up on a 1200. Nothing, right. to, nothing to really turn your head at, but it wasn't bad. Right, right, right. Um, but you would need to have, obviously, a high SAT score. And, mm -hmm. you know, the joke of the 90s and all that stuff was, you know, how much Latin there was on the SAT, how much, you know, random yeah. things. And it wasn't really a, a thing of, like... You can't study for it. You study how to take it, yeah. not study the content individually. Exactly. So it's like practice problems. Right. Um, but the LSAT is a very, very, very important exam that is probably the singularly most important thing besides your GPA in college to get into a good law school. Yeah. So let's say you do okay or let's say first and foremost you do fantastic in mm -hmm. high school and you get into the harvards the Princeton, the princeton's the this the that yeah then you would be able to go to a good school and the problem is that if you were not at that caliber though and yeah. you flunk out of those that's boy that's all she wrote yeah but let's say you actually uh, are at the high echelon that's able to maintain and do it because remember, the yeah. hard thing about these colleges is you have a lot of valedictorians and a yeah. lot of high-achieving people. Right. If you have all the valedictorians coming to Harvard, mm. there's only going to be one valedictorian at Harvard. Exactly. And, and that, so, yeah. Yeah. So you have all these people that are the... stiff. Yeah, you're the creme de la creme when it comes to your area or even your state, but it's yeah. like you're literally amongst the creme de la creme. So right. you're you're coming into an insanely vicious area. Yeah. Um. And that's where we need to really see about that because, you know, GPA and mm -hmm. all, not even to mention people doing Adderall and things like that to focus yeah. and how things like ADHD and learning disabilities and reading levels. Right. And, and, and they might be doing some other stuff to stay up and feel good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and also binge drinking when it comes yeah. to that stuff and people doing really reckless things because, you know, that work hard, play hard mindset starts exactly. to bud. Right. Um, and, you know, so all of that, 
uh, if you are on your ball and you go to say Princeton or Harvard, then you would be able to go to their law school program right. after you do your LSAT. And your LSAT is a, an examination that, um, and, uh, by the way, when it comes to all these guys, I myself am middle of the way through college. I am just getting all of this anecdotal evidence from people yeah. that are going through the process, people that have been through the process, um, and people that are maybe a little bit ahead of me, or some people. I've talked right. to a few people that are in law and things like that. Right, and, right. I'm by no means a professional, and this is no means like any super, super serious thing, but it's just my overall grasp right, it's of just, it. Just trying, trying to flesh out uh, what Uncle Phil would have had to go through. It would have had to go through, yes. Right. And, and that's not even considering the fact that he was a black man doing it back then. Exactly, that right. too. So he had to go to, now he also could have gone to an HBCU and done this too, yeah. a very prominent HBCU, and that is a possibility, but um, for him to penetrate as far as he did into the white market of mm -hmm. that, he definitely had to work his tail off in an HBCU or uh, a good school regardless. Right, right, right. So if you're going that Princeton, Harvard route, then you can go to their law schools. You do the uh, LSAT, which is a uh, more so, and I've taken a few practice LSATs and it is a ridiculous test, man, because really? it is your, because you have to be able to break down arguments and you have to wow. demonstrate a very, very high level ability to understand the concepts right, that right, are right. being like, logical fallacies and things like that and yeah. being able to call things um, and they'll ask you really weird logic based questions so that's why mm. you know I heard you say hmm but uh, a bachelor's of philosophy a lot of people do get that makes sense because you have to be a very good abstract thinker to be wow. in law yeah um, so and then and it, you know a few people like there's been stories of engineers or mathematicians that got bachelor's degrees and those things going and doing well but english or philosophy are two major ones i hear about right, right. Which, or pre-law as well which too. makes sense because uh you need a, a firm grasp of the language in order to uh go into law as well as you know philosophy and and how arguments are formed yeah, exactly the of them. exactly um, so with that, you would then go, uh, take your LSAT and go to the school and that's a three year program. Right. And, you know, in college, the people you interact with, you know, they may be doing a different major. They may be doing this, maybe doing that. But when you're in law school, it is like, no, 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 no. You are on this track with these people. These are right. your classmates. You, right. First year, second year, third year. Like these are the people you're with. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and all of that. And let's say. And you have a very low margin of error. Like I can imagine. Like you, you can flunk Everything. out of law school. Yeah. Mm. Not to mention how expensive it is too. Boy, and that's the thing. Uh, uh, in certain careers, a lot of people they they get so far and they've dedicated their lives to it, and then you flunk out. You know, a lot of people they 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 they, they choose not to be here with us in the land of the living. Exactly. Certain things, you know. Yeah. Um, so let's say that you know already that is already like some. Bravo no. that you have, you know, come to completion of law school. Right. There is one final thing before you can legitimately practice law in America, and that mm. is you have to pass the bar examination. Boy, and I heard that's a beast. Yes. So the two big hurdles, there's, there's several big hurdles along the way. I mean, the first one just being high school, you know. Yeah. But let's say you got all the way and you pass your bar examination. You passed it from a very good law school mm -hmm. um, and you've passed it and now you are licensed to practice law. Right. And now this is where the uh, the law schools come into play. There's mm -hmm. a discussion of T14 or T5 or T50. And um, for those that may not know that, it means like the top schools because right. a lot of times, and even what, can't, not, even what Akis and I were talking about mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, the uh, good old boy system. Yeah. Uh, with the good old boy system, you know, it's uh, the fraternities and where that comes into play. You have these uh, uh, law firms that may be only picking people from mm -hmm. certain colleges. Yeah. So if this is a top law firm, well, the top law firm, and these are but majority of Princeton graduates. Mm -hmm. Guess where they're going to go recruit? Princeton. Yes. Right. And a top law firm from you know Columbia. Mm -hmm. So then they're going to go and they're going to get Columbia graduates. Right. The good, so, boy, the good old boy system yeah, everywhere. Yes. Over. So if you're grabbed up by a large law firm, you're going to be working your way through the top 
mm-hmm. you know, and you're yeah. going to be working and working and working. These guys, you know, the majority, when people talk about lawyers, you know, it's not just objection, Your Honor, objection, objection. No, yeah. like majority of it is reading litigation, you know. Right. And boy, yeah, they, they got to get in them, them uh, cases and know how to break them down and, and the amount of memorization that has to be done. And well, yeah, it's, it's discussed even in law school. People have to be comfortable with reading about three to four hundred pages a week of material. <laughs> wow. And yeah. this is not, you know, this isn't. Uh, cat, in the hat. cat in the hat this yeah. isn't no fun leisure reading like fault in our stars or anything right. like that this is technical documents and this is cases and things like you that you gotta be able to go through that yes um so you will be reading all of these things and going through and it's majority reading and mm-hmm. understanding preparing your cases if you are uh you know a uh, a, a court lawyer and there's so right. many different types of attorneys too um, so many different types of law to go into, it, you know, it's corporate counsel, meaning, you know, right. like the people that are drafting up the terms and conditions right. that uh, all of us read thoroughly, right? Oh, yeah. I we mean, all read thoroughly hey, through before. From front, front to back. <laughs> um, making sure it's legally bulletproof and everything. Right. And there's, uh, you know, family and, and law. There's divorce right. lawyers. There's uh, uh, workers' comp lawyers. Mm. There's you know, all these different types of lawyers. Um, that's and, not, and, that, and that's all before even becoming a partner. Yeah, well before becoming a partner right. because you have to work through and you start through as a baseline attorney and you work your way up through. Um, and I'm not 100% sure on the specifics, but uh, if we're assuming it's similar to the banking model, you would typically be spending uh, mm-hmm. anywhere from three to five years at each level. And that's um. And yeah. it would go kind of like with banking, like analyst and then associate. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I'm sure it's, I think it's after that director and then VP and so that's like the fourth level on this thing right. of like bosses. That's when you start talking about like the partners, quote unquote. Man, and the thing that Uncle Phil had to go through all that mm-hmm. to get that crib in Bel Air. Mm-hmm. Man. He had to be about it. Yeah. And you see, you know, uh, in today's dollars, uh, an approximation would be if you were to start as a lawyer at a top law firm, you know, mm-hmm. you're talking about offer it maybe one hundred fifty to $200,000. Yeah. Not immediately, maybe like 100000 starting, starting, and then, mm-hmm. you know, very quickly, one hundred fifty dollars to $200,000. And then next level, three hundred to $400,000. Next right. level, maybe seven hundred dollars to $800,000. And then we start reaching a partner is where they start, you, you know, you own a share of the company or the, yeah. the firm. So that means that you get to share in the profits of the firm. Yeah. And that's where you start hitting that echelon of the 1.5s to $3 million kind right. of incomes. Um, and crunching, and in today's dollars, Uncle Phil was probably making in the realm of one to $1.5 million. A year. Yeah. Man, that is insane. Being a, a partner at a law firm. Um, but remember, mm-hmm. this is also taxed, so he's paying. Oh, yeah, boy. So, you know, and that's where, I mean, he's a lawyer, so he obviously mm-hmm. probably is very savvy with it. Yeah. But it's a thing where, you know, the, the 37, the top tax bracket in America right now is mm-hmm. about 37.5%. So about 40%. It, it, and it's gradual. I remember, like, tax law, yeah. I'm not 100% straight on it. I'm not a CPA or anything like that. Right. But he's paying anywhere in the realm, especially also in California, which has a significant well. significant state tax. And being in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. a significant city tax, He, right. I could easily see him paying as much as um, probably $500,000 in taxes. I'm talking about five times a six-figure, you know what I mean? yeah. And, and and it's 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 really good that you did a research on everything like uh, uh, when it concerns that mark because um, it really fleshes out just how much of an anomaly an Uncle Phil uh, is work-wise. Exactly. But um, but one thing I do want to say as far as, now I don't know how the new show does it. I I my, I don't know why they want to reboot this um, as a drama, but I I, I think. One thing that Uncle Phil, uh, uh, or you know, as far as the whole legacy of Fresh Prince of Bel Air, we have to appreciate Uncle Phil really served as a great father figure, and he always had uh, great lessons and stuff like that when it came to. Um, uh, well, you you want to say R. P. Uncle Phil? First things first, Uncle Phil. Phil. Uncle Phil. Phil. <laughs> For real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got we, we got to do the scene. First things first, first recipes, Uncle, Uncle Phil. Phil. For Ooh. real, <laughs> but, but I, I just saw it on your face. I, I, I try to hold it back. Like, I, I need to say it. But um, 
That's for all you J. Cole fans out there. If, if, shoot, for, for, for all your Uncle Phil fans out there. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but we really got to uh, appreciate the fact that he was a really good, uh, f- I mean, we use the term father figure, but just a good black male figure, mm-hmm. you know, and that's why uh, 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 a lot of people clung to Uncle Phil because I mean the first Prince of Bel Air wasn't just Will Smith; it was a really good dynamic between him and Uncle Phil and uh, Carlton and uh, uh, all these different uh, Aunt Viv, you mm-hmm. know, the first one, the dark skin Aunt Viv, of course, <laughs> and um, and just the lessons that would be taught uh, within the show, yes. you know, and um, uh, 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 after you know you share your thoughts on, on that, I do want to kind of transition to even another uh, 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 good father figure that I would like to touch on as well. But 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 share your thoughts when it comes to uh, yes. that point. Um, and also, uh, just for more technicality's sake, I, I just I love being technical. So yeah. um, the this is another thing too is that uh, a lot of times any politician you see they have a, a very significant link to um, either business mm-hmm. if they wanted to become say a treasury or something like that or they have a very significant link to law for them to be a policymaker and things like that. Right, right. And then also that's where the military comes into play too because you have uh, people like Eisenhower who were in the military and things. But um, I remember there was one episode in particular mm-hmm. that uh, kind of demonstrated how much sacrifice that Uncle Phil had to give right, um, right. in his personal life because, uh, you know, this is a Hail Mary pass to, to pass the bar exam of a mid-tier university. Mm-hmm. But for him to graduate from a high tier university, um, uh, and then for him to not only do that but make it several ranks above and go into being a partner at the law firm, right. that is just an astronomically uh, special thing for him to do, yeah. um, and to be praised. But uh, it, going back to the politics thing, um, there was even an episode I remember watching with. Uh, Uncle Phil talking mm. to some of his partners and everything and him going into actual politics. They were trying to talk to him about actually running for, I believe it was either a senator or a governor or a House of Representatives member. Like, yeah, yeah. Him being, like, really in politics. Mm. And uh, Aunt Viv, she was heartbroken. She was devastated when she found out about that plot. Yeah. Because... Such a sacrifice. It's such a sacrifice. And then uh, Uncle Phil was talking to her and she said, Phil... You've been telling me for the past 30 years when it's going to be our time. Man, that's heavy. Because it has had to have been sacrificed. Mm -hmm. I don't think that man has worked less than a 40-hour work week, less than probably a 50-hour work week for 30 years, damn near. And it just goes to show just how that, um, you know, those careers really just just stay, they they consume. uh, They can (laughs) be a consuming uh, force to somebody. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and him taking it to that, you know, thing. And that's why a lot of these politicians, I mean, not to get on current politics like that, but that's why a lot of them, like Bernie Sanders or um, Biden, yeah. um, are, are so, so uh, old, I guess, to use a <laughs> non-PC term. A non-PC yeah. term. They're just so old. Like, yeah, so you know, withered. To imagine someone my grandma's age still in the hot seat is like, you know. and the hottest of the seats. Right. Uh, that's like, and remember, these people have been working. Biden has been in politics since before my father was born. Yeah. And my father is no spring chicken. Right. He's been in politics. Man. So. And, and still sitting in that hot seat. The yeah. The in 80s. <laughs> um, so that's just something, I guess, uh, to look at of just the level of sacrifice and uh, how his mindset has been. And you even see how with Carlton, he puts a lot of pressure on himself. Because, I can imagine. You know, and that's a big thing that happens with those cases. Huge shoes to fill. Humongous shoes to fill. So much so, the, the contemplation of using drugs and things like that. Yeah. Just trying to keep up. Yeah. Um, so it definitely uh, it leaves a lasting impression. And, you know, I mean, the fear at the end, end of the day of losing all of that stuff. Right. Um, because... Yeah, I mean. I mean, let's be honest, Uncle Phil's house, with inflation and everything, it's about a $1.5 to $2 million house. Yeah. And, I mean, I know he's making, after taxes, you know, 700 thou or 800 thou, mm. but, you know, that... It's a lot of expenses. <laughs> it's a lot of expenses. You know, yeah. that butler ain't cheap. Yeah, and, 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 mm. and it really kind of get, uh, gets kind of scary when you consider that... I mean, the amount of black families that have lost wealth, you know, be it uh, taken from them or, or, you know, circumstances, you know, and that's, gosh, that, 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 that in itself is a whole other situation as well. 
Yes. Um, but, so uh, we can switch gears though if you want. You no, know, to touch on the, the like you know thoughts on him being a father, but father figure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So him being a yeah. father figure. Yes, I definitely think he was uh, foundational and important to uh, Will Smith because a lot of times people in the black community have to deal with either a deadbeat father or a father that was never there. Yeah. And, you know, while it is uh, uh, mentally a strain to have such big shoes to fill, mm -hmm. that at least means it's positive pressure upward. Right, right. And, and, and allow, just like you said, it's, it's a push to do something. Because it's like, I'm not doing jack compared to what my father was doing right. versus, because, you know, when someone, if they're like, I'm 30 and I haven't been locked up yet, compared to their fathers, they're living life. Even yeah. though they're working at McDonald's. Right. Man, and, and, and it really just kind of goes to show just, you know, trying to set uh, better examples for the future. But um, as far as uh, uh, to actually transition, which is a very clean transition, uh, uh, Ray Campbell from Sister Sister, he actually, there was actually an episode where he did something similar to uh, uh, Uncle Phil, where he was actually running for, uh, I think it was governor mm -hmm. of uh, Detroit as well. And, um... I I I I want to kind of highlight sister sister as far as like it was a really good TV show and I really didn't realize the similarities because it does have kind of a dark back backdrop of you know both of them being um, orphans you know and being adopted by two different parents and uh, the the mother being dead and all these different things but you know of course they made it a sitcom yes. and this it kind of uh, lightens it but it, they also do touch on a lot of. Um, a lot of really pertinent situations, and uh, uh, Ray Campbell is another good example of uh, somebody who, you know, made a way. Uh, and, and I actually do appreciate the fact that he was uh, entrepreneur. You know, he um, he uh, owned his own uh, limousine business as well as um, uh, Lisa on her own uh, business. Even though you know her business, you know, didn't start getting off the floor until a little later, but um, but. Uh, yeah, uh, her business not getting off the floor until uh, a little later, but I think that was really a good um, example of, like, when he was helping Lisa with her business, and it was just, like, actually building black business and stuff like that. Yes. So, Sister Sister is another good example of a good uh, 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 father figure as well. And, I mean, a good family dynamic overall, even though the... the oh, most they, definitely. They, they weren't married. Ray Campbell definitely plays a straight man in that situation. Right, but uh, I do want to take this time because there, 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 there's a good bit of stuff that we could uh, cover. But I do want to take the time to even talk about black kids TV shows. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I was uh, talking to somebody and I was actually reminded of the show Little Bill. Yeah, 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 yeah. You thought about that one in the minute. I really, I haven't. But that was some baller jazz music they had in that show. Oh man, yeah. And it's one of those things where you really don't see a lot of that in, that, in this day and age, especially without an agenda. Because I'm, I, I was actually thinking about. I mean, first off, Little Bill. You know, mm -hmm. what I mean, you have a black, you, you have a, a black TV show with a black, a good black family. Mm -hmm. You know, with a with a dark skinned mother. You know, which uh, 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 which you know you, you don't really don't even see that much. Uh, in this day and age and you know it taught good values and it was really good for you know kids to be able to see themselves represented mm -hmm. and uh you had shows for instance like the proud family and that's a raven which you know was uh, uh which showed uh, uh black faces on tv in a positive light with in a positive light with lessons but the kicker is both of those shows have been rebooted and are now being used as uh, uh agenda mules Yes, and I mean, there is a certain amount that we can be upset with you know, the agenda mules, but at the end of the day, since we've even talked about this, the genesis of sitcoms and even TV has been agenda pushing, but I guess it's right. it's how oppositional is it to the culture at large. Yeah, and, and the thing about it is, it's not true to what the shows used to be. Well, that you know? too, and it, it's definitely, if you're going to push an agenda, hey, just do a different, just use a different IP, right. because you're tarnishing the legacy of that those exactly. things had but i mean nothing is sacred in hollywood i mean they'll reboot the hell out of anything yeah and that's another thing that, that even has to be touched on is you know when it comes to because yeah, you know I, I have no desire to you know watch these shows or anymore but we do have to stop allowing media to be let, letting nostalgia push our taste in media you know because uh oftentimes i mean the reason that raven's home exists and the Proud Family Louder and Prouder exists is because so many people were nostalgic for these shows 
and wanted them to come back and now they it comes back and it's tarnished you know and now the legacy is kind of uh, uh dashed away uh so that's that's definitely something to be cognizant of and it's not surprising that they did it because they, they, they're truly not geared for kids anymore even though they might be on disney is you you know they 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 make the there's this whole market of kind of um nostalgia there's this whole nostalgia market that's been pushed to millennials mm -hmm. especially and so this is just another example of them kind of playing into this nostalgia market with the proud family and that's a raven well yes um and i i think as far as when you're talking about not really for kids i mean we're definitely going through a culture shift um most if in large part uh in the black community but as you know america as a whole right um so when it may have more say lgbt things or it may yeah. have more agenda pushing on uh uh swirling or stuff like that right it i i think i, I very much so take a a, a kind of watch and see kind of perspective yeah. on things to where I just want to see what's going on. Um, and I want to let the world tell me what it is. So, I mean, you can obviously condemn certain aspects as they differ from your views and your uh, personal beliefs. Mm -hmm. But I also think the it, really, the, to me, the, the tarnishing aspect of it is the uh, resurrection of, of a you know, laid to rest intellectual property. Right. And then the mutilation of it for a new cause. If you're going to do something for a new cause, exactly. don't mutilate something. And, and that's, I feel, uh, a big point when it comes to that is the fact that they kind of took away from the fact that it was a black TV show and made it LGBT show, or in the fact of, in the case of Raven's Home, you know, made it a show where, you know, there's no good black male influence in the show. So you have that aspect. Don't worry, I only got a few more topics and then we're gonna get into the main dish. So, you know, do not, do not, do not worry, do not fret. Um, uh, what do you think about, I mean, with the Boondocks, you think they're gonna do a reboot? I no, because it was such a it was such a politically hostile TV show yeah. that them resurrecting it. I mean, someone may have the gall to, <laughs> but yeah, if it doesn't have Aaron, reception, if it doesn't have Aaron Magruder's name on it, I'm not watching it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if it doesn't have Aaron Magruder's name on it, it's not the Boondocks. That's why we don't talk about the fourth season. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing that I do want to touch on with uh, uh, the Boondocks, and then I want to kind of get into the main uh, dish of this uh, episode. Um, with the Boondocks, I don't think that it would be able to survive in this day's climate. I mean, truly, it would have been a, a, a flounder out of water. Well, it, it, and that's where I, I would slightly disagree with you, Keith, mm. because I watch South Park um, at my job, since that's what they throw on sometimes. Yeah. And... I am consistently astonished at the gall of the right. topics that they will discuss. Now, will it be hated on Twitter? Of course. Yeah. But even look at a contemporary example of Dave Chappelle mm. and his full-on war against the transgender community now. Right. I, I think that you're not giving enough credit to you know, viewers like us. Right, right. And how much that you know, there are still people that would support it. And I think... That, that is a point. That it, is a point. Now, would it survive under certain networks? Most definitely not. You right. know, they're at the mercy of whoever is funding them. It wouldn't be on Cartoon Network, for instance. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, would it exist in certain spheres? No. It would be right. axed immediately. But um, I just think that it would probably not have the same budget. Yeah. That's one yeah. thing. And it would probably not have the same critical, wide reception, you know. That is true. But could it survive? I think it could. It would just definitely be so much more uh, visible in terms of how it gets lambasted on Twitter right. or on YouTube or something like that. Here's the irony. I believe that a lot of people that are calling for the Boondocks back, because they might, you know, just... Uh, the Boondocks is a very versatile TV show in the fact that it's able to uh, 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 appeal to, you know, people that are... You can just use lowbrow and highbrow. Yeah, low people that are more, you know, people in the community that are more lowbrow versus ones that are more highbrow. You know, it's able to appeal to both. But uh, I'm, I actually believe that a lot of people that are calling for the boon, the boon to come back, to come back, 
because we're so far removed from the R. Kelly situation. We're yes. so far removed from uh, a lot of political things that were occurring during those eras. And if they were to actually come back and Aaron Magruder was able to make the political commentary on today's climate, I feel like a lot of people that are wishing for it back would reel. Yes, those people would reel, but there would also be people that would support it too. Most definitely. So, I, I like I said, I don't think it would have the same funding um, and the same wide critical perception, but would it still get put out? Most definitely. I think it still would. Yeah. Um, now, do you think they're going to put it out? I don't know. With the death of Granddad's voice actor, that definitely is a significant blow or to the legacy. Or spoon. Yeah, uh, because I'm not gonna lie, the show is just not the same without him. No, yeah, it it it, it can't be. And I, I mean, I, I really don't. Anybody that would be trying to uh, voice Granddad, which I mean, my my personal hope is that they have enough of the recordings done. To possibly uh, maybe stitch together something, stitch right, stitch it together maybe uh, uh, with some fan funding or something along those lines. We still have um, GoFundMe. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind throwing some money into that. But um, yeah. if they were to able to get that done with uh, Reese Witherspoon as a voice actor, then yeah. But if somebody, if it was somebody else doing it, it wouldn't be the same. It, it would just be somebody trying to do a, a, a Reese Witherspoon impression in a way. Well, and. Um yeah, like I, I definitely think that would be a, a, a loss. But also, if Aaron McGregor were to have like a fifth season vision that like for his you know life's work completion, right? And if he were to just try and finish it, let's say so, let's say that Da Vinci uh, uh, was trying to finish one of his great works, and he ran right. out, he ran out of uh, a specific color of paint, and he was yeah. on the last quarter of his thing. It's like you got to make do. And I yeah. think that if you have a couple episodes done and it's like the tail end of it, um, I think that It'll you can permissible. give us an ap- you can give us an approximation right. of what his vision would be just to finish it because it is just to give that final Mwah. right. This is done. This right. is my alma mater. This is my life's legacy. That would be that would be perfect. That 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 that, that honestly would be a dream for uh, uh, you know to see that happen maybe within the next five or ten years. So yeah, Aaron Magruder on the unlikely. Uh, um, chance that you ever come across this uh, please start a GoFundMe we would not mind uh, 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 throwing some money Most your definitely. way but um, you, to get to the meat and potatoes of the show you know recently we had uh, and I'm not sure if you actually do you know how Blackish ends? No I'm not familiar. So actually what they did is they had a funeral for the home that they yeah a funeral for the home that they had on the blackest set and what they did is uh now they're moving from the white neighborhood into a black neighborhood so what are your thoughts on uh initial thoughts on that before we get into just the i mean the whole entire unrealistic <laughs> well thing that is blackish I mean, there's multiple angles, you know, I, I, on on initial hearing, you know, they can go one of two ways, moving into a black neighborhood of a bunch of Dre's or moving into a black neighborhood because he lost his job and they're just trying to move into a different house. Well, it seemed like it was out of, um, it was out of um, a want to connect with the, uh, the black community more. My thing, my opinion of it, the fact that his kids are already fully grown you you've already had them around. Too little, too late. Come on, right? Okay. It's too little, too late. I mean, to me personally, as somebody you know critiquing mm-hmm. the plot of everything, most of the kids are 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 you know over have already gone through puberty. Zoe's already out of, out of the house. Zoe's already out of the house. You know, they they're all older, and so whatever you've already had them grow up in this white area. You they're already they've already been imprinted by uh, that experience. So you moving them into this newer uh, area is not really going to make much of a difference. Heck, even the uh, the kid, I think um, I think on the show he's like freaking six, five or something along those lines. So, I mean, maybe for him there might be a, a yeah, bit of a demonstrable difference. difference yeah. Right. But um, as far as like the whole house, it's, I mean, I feel like it almost is a statement on how sad it is that his mindset didn't change for so long because um you know the creator of the show uh kenya barris he's very much um i mean it seems like this show was you know made for white liberals Mm -hmm. you know and and uh, if you actually look at 
the writers and the uh, uh, the production team, there there was a lot of um, white liberals involved, but uh, there there was always a vying for acceptance that that show had a theme of, and of course, you know, of you know me as a keys, I, well, I'm not a big fan of that, you know. So, um, uh, what are your thoughts on? I mean, just that whole entire plot device being so, used. Yeah, and I mean, towards the latter end of my middle school experience, I remember seeing the start and the inception of Blackish, the show, and yeah. just kind of out of curiosity looking at it. Um, it definitely uh, was a show that I think had a bit of an identity crisis. Most definitely. Um, yeah. And to see that final switcheroo is definitely interesting. Mm. But I've also seen even changes in in people, um, including, you know, say my mother and things like that, yeah. that they have gone through uh, realizations and actualization that, for one reason or another, mm. has been stunted. Um, yeah. And I subscribe to the notion of better late than never. You know, it's never too late right. to do the right thing. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, now, I'm not saying that in the case of uh, his thing, it, it's the right or wrong thing to move from his neighborhood or that neighborhood. It's just, uh, you know, I'm sure that Dre is not going to have a, a constant comparison anxiety, for example. Right, in, right. In, in that neighborhood. And it's all about you and the reality that you make for yourself. Yeah, well, and, and, and well, I, I guess I do... Uh, uh, or there is a certain air of being forgiven when uh, trying to be forgiving when somebody uh, has been, uh, I guess, a bit misled for so long and finally try to make the decision. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the youngest child is still there. So there is still that factor. That it, I mean, not all hope is lost, you know? Well, and it's also, uh, there's two examples to me. It's the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. Because, you know, that's the thing of, uh, it takes a lot um, of courage to admit that you're wrong, especially so far deep into something. Yeah. And uh, so quitting contributing to something that you see isn't working mm -hmm. and having the courage because... Dre, he's not a spring chicken. He's he's an older man, yeah. and making such a cataclysmic change in his life was definitely uncomfortable for a lot of people in his family. Yeah, I can imagine. So that is one serious note, but also another thing too is, you know, the best time to plant a tree was fifty years ago. The second best time <laughs> yeah. is today. That's true. Yeah. Because every day that you don't go on with that is another day of regret. So if That's you have true. it seriously in your head, it's just like plant that damn tree. Mm -hmm. Because while, you know, Zoe and um, Junior may have yeah. gone on and done their things, you still have influential, you still have uh, uh, impressionable children. You're still developing. And I mean, if, this is also, you know, the, the slightly amoral thing. But, you know, I'm also like, this is a bit of an experiment now. Right, right. <laughs> because, I mean, Dre and Bo, there was kind of a, a, a half joke under it that they were kind of broke. Not going to lie. Yeah, and, and I would love for you to break that down. Um, yeah, so, and I can break down the finances of Blackish in a second, but um, long story short, I mean, you know, the constant uh, mm. uh, uh, belittlement from the neighbors, you know, especially toward the right. children, like, are, are you being fed? Are you doing this, right. that, the next thing? And that kind of, like, that speaks to a larger thing because of the, mm. the trope of the quote-unquote quote Karen. Um, exactly. And right. being all up in your business just for the sake of, you know, like bringing the pie over. Like, oh, I brought a pie! You just know. to get inside your house to see what you're yeah, all about. Exactly. Right. Uh, it, that nosiness and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And just that, that condescending nature of it as well. Yes, mm -hmm. 100%. So with it, I, I definitely think that um, for those children I, I i'm very curious now with zoe and them yeah. they've grown up in a certain way but for the younger kids i want to see how they would like what, how they would, would, fare. what would the difference be yeah right um, you know with a five-year-old versus you know kids that are what pushing 16 15 uh, yeah and yeah. another thing too is uh so as i was talking about the changing of means you know dre you know uh akis and i have always been in uh for a long time, held uh, Dre in admiration as like the cool dad, you know. Boy, yeah, yeah. I, I remember even there was a period of time when, um, because I mean, as I've uh, expressed on uh, the broadcast before, I have a background in marketing and I've uh, worked in marketing. But um, uh, when I was younger, you know, it was one of those things where I looked at what Dre did. I was like, oh my gosh, I want to be in his position. I want to be in his shoes. Yes. Um, so we can take a second to talk about just the means that Dre and Bo had. Right. Um, 
and you know how it's almost impossible to fathom that they were having financial hardships, even though they were both having mm-hmm. very high profile careers. Right. But it's all about living below your means. It's not mm-hmm. how much you make; it's how much you save. Which is something that uh, a lot of our people have an issue with. So, uh, uh, if you could go and break that down uh, yes. for us, for the so audience. when it comes to this, a very prolific thing in the first episode for Dre was that he was supposed to be promoted promoted to the VP of the company just in general, this firm, right. this marketing firm, and he actually got turned into the uh, VP of Urban Marketing, I believe, right? Urban Mar- yeah, I Something believe that's like what that. it was, yeah. Um, and that's the whole, you know, little ditzy, little racist thing in and of itself, but, right. um, yeah, you're in the urban department. <laughs> you know why. Because <laughs> uh, you're hip. Yeah, you're with it. Um, but... Uh, and then you also have uh, Bo, who was an anesthesiologist. Right. And for those that don't know... And she did get it promoted to uh, the board. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm taking a snapshot of Bo and Dre's finances at them being a VP uh, at a, a, you know, a sizable marketing mm-hmm. firm and um, uh, anesthesiolo- Bo well, being an anesthesiologist. Right. So... For those that don't know, an anesthesiologist is the one that deals with, you know, the the funny gas, the knockout gas kind of right, thing. Right. And it is very important because you, in a way, are uh, putting someone in a kind of coma. more permanent, yeah, in a, in a coma. Right. Uh, that you know, you're 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 not killing them and bringing them back, but you're definitely putting them in a very, very, very depressed state right. that needs to be carefully monitored and it's things like that. Very uh, uh, particular particular science that goes into anesthesiology anesthesiology yes and um so with the medical profession as a whole it actually follows very similar to law and that's why those two degrees law and medical Mm. um are uh denoted tied so closely tied yes and you also have those doctor lawyer combos very often yeah um (laughs) boy ain't that so but with uh the md you have uh their denoted as a medical doctor and the same thing with a, a, mm-hmm. a lawyer they are referred to as a jd or a jurist doctor right, right, um, right now they their title is not doctor they can't use that i actually found that was an interesting thing <laughs> and that's so um, that's interesting yeah they they <laughs> unless you are a medical professional you cannot use doctor so a lawyer cannot yeah. i'm doctor so-and-so no you're a lawyer you're jd you're so-and-so right. jd like, that's what they always joke about, how all these letters they have on the end of their name. Right, right, right. Because, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so, CPA, a certified public accountant. Right. So-and-so and so-and-so, MBA, Master's of Business Administration. Right. Um, so-and-so, MD. Right. So, uh, yes, Bo went through uh, the medical school, school route, and, it, you know, in large part for... Um, uh, Uncle Phil's accession to the top is very similar for Bo's accession mm-hmm. to the top as far as good high school, you know, being a well-rounded person and extracurriculars, right. athletics or clubs, what have you, um, and then going to school and getting your bachelor's. Right. Um, typically, they would go into biology or chemistry or pre-med right. instead of pre-law. Um, and then you would have to get accepted into a medical school. Mm-hmm. And it's very similar. It's four years, though, for medical school. And this is where it gets a lot more screwy because they have a lot more education afterward. Break it down, brother. Break it down. So uh, you would go through your bachelor's degree, and some people may, may be able to finesse that for free, right? Mm. But <laughs> yeah, a couple of them. With grants all, all and this and that yeah. and, and stuff like that, or let's say you have not wealthy parents but well-off parents that were right, able right, to pay right. for your schooling. Um, so you get accepted into medical school, and that's a four-year program off mm. And in that, it is... I've talked to people that are in medical school, and it is just a absolute slugfest. Yeah, yeah, you're just going through and you're fighting. I mean, books, just books. Textbooks. You're you're you're, all, you're faces in a book. Some people fall asleep studying. Uh, it's it it consumes a good bit of your life. Yes, and uh, talking to them, they have like, and it's you, we can talk about like brute force studying, where it's just mm. you know you read it you read it again, you read it, you read it again. Like, you know, just crack yeah. open the books and read it. It's uh, uh, one of the, my friends that I've had that uh, is a medical student, she was saying, like, you you literally can't do that. Like, you have no. to just, like, Anki and, like, they have to, like, almost use algorithms to learn how to study faster. Yeah, because it's one of those things. That, 
when you start to get into to those careers, law and medical, you actually get into uh, uh, where you have to learn the art of studying. Because yes. even um that uh the I forgot his name um but the the channel I showed you with the 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 Asian gentleman that that uh teaches how to study. Yeah. You know, like he is a doctor, and that's why he had to sit down and study the art of studying because mm-hmm. it's just that intensive yes uh so after that let's uh, let's say that you make it through you then have to pass several boards Mm. to actually um pass medical school and everything right uh and there's actually a final board after your residency i believe there there's three two or three boards and um but after your uh after you finish your uh, medical school, yeah. then you would go into a thing which is called residency. And boy, uh, uh, I actually know somebody who's uh, in residency to be a surgeon, and they work 80 hours a week, some t- oftentimes, and it's to the point where they got beds for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and residency, uh, I was learning how screwy it is, because I do know a sister that actually is in medical school, but I also do know um, other people uh, in the white community that are in uh, medical school as well mm-hmm. and uh, I mean obviously you know the sister she has different means than the more of course of the white community um, but it's still hard work just the same exactly um, it's just you know how much support you have behind you mm-hmm. but uh, and just sheer will you know it's another thing exactly um, so with that you know the competition for uh, residency is deadly serious mm-hmm. you're fighting not only to get into medical school <laughs> you're fighting in medical school right. to get to a residency man and, and and that's where a lot of people, just like I said with the with the law school, a lot of people when they see that they didn't make it as a resident, they choose not to stay here in the land of living with us. Exactly, and that's you know full of drugs, full of all these different coping mechanisms, full right. of binge drinking and all that stuff, mm-hmm. because of just that you know work hard, play hard mentality that starts right. to form. Um, so after this, you come up to residency where, you know, there's different pathways if you were to say be a pediatrician or you right. to say be uh, uh, in Bo's case an anesthesiologist mm-hmm. or um, uh, or proctologist or gynecologist and things right. like that. Uh, you have definitely different times that you would have to put in, mm. but it's also different degrees of severity and also mm-hmm. wildly different swings in income. Right, exactly. Because, you know, when you're talking about a pediatrician, you know, this is uh, uh, the figures I've seen, and I'm just spitballing here, would be in the realm of two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Right, right. Um, but then it can go as high for, in the case of the really, really high echelon things such as plastic surgery mm-hmm. or neurosurgery. Right. Um, those are where it's like, wow, like high, high, high level stuff, and these guys are making upwards of half a million dollars in their occupation. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but there's the nasty little thing of you know. Uh, the fact that during residency, mm-hmm. you had to compete all the way to get to residency. And remember, this is medical school. Medical school is not cheap. Yeah. Medical school, majority of the student loan debt in America actually is from graduate studies. I can imagine. It's a, it's a very heavy uh, uh, lead ball in a way. Yes. So with that, um, you have these uh, uh, debts from school, and it's very easy to have well over six figures in debt. Mm-hmm. And then when they come up on residency, you know, you're getting paid a, a salary of in the realm of fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year, right. which for a regular working man or a woman, that's pretty legit. Not gonna lie. You are. But with someone that has this albatross of one hundred eighty thousand dollars in student loan debt, yeah, you got a harpy eagle on your back. <laughs> and remember, this is also a thing that gains interest. This is debt after all, mm-hmm. and I'm going to only loan you money with the promise of more money in return. So right. And that Sally May at the end of the day wants money. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, it, it is definitely a thing where you're making very low wages comparatively to the amount of debt, and you're right. doing this for you know uh, uh, four to to anywhere from four to seven years. Right. So then, and only then after that, you have to then pass, I believe, a final board to then um, go on to become an MD. So yeah. in the process, post high school studies, yeah. you're talking about in the realm of. I would say eight to 12 years of studies to become a a medical doctor. And then at which point you are a medical doctor and you can make the, you know, lofty sums. Right. And now I I think this is a good time to kind of touch on just how, um, sorry for the squeaking, we're kind of moving uh, uh, in my chair, but to, they were perfect. But um, this is, I feel, a good time to kind of touch on just how 
the blackish dynamic wouldn't be able to work with how busy uh, uh, Bo and uh, Dre would have been. And not only the, and not, not only that, but also the financial aspect too. Yeah, if, so, if you could definitely touch on the financial aspect. Uh, so uh, right, right, fast. Yes, and uh, a trope amongst all of these things is basically you know be good in school, work your way through college, and then start this long pathway, and then you can make the big bucks, right? Right, right, right. So right. with Dre, it's very much the same. Uh, for a lot of you more business oriented folks, it's you know it's a corporate structure and you right. can get, get a degree in whatever and then work your way up through the ranks right. and that's a lot of you know as they call it uh you know brown nosing and things like that yeah, exactly. to get to the level a lot of hard nights and things like that yeah um i just wanted to make sure there was clarity as far as medical and law because that one is very much so regimented yeah whereas you have things like nepotism or you have things like brown nosing and networking that can get you higher positions faster right, in the exactly. corporate sense right so, anyways, we have rough approximations of figures for income for Bo and Dre of approximately for uh, Dre's position in the realm of $250,000 a year. Yeah. And then for Bo, anywhere from three hundred dollars to $400,000 a year. Right. Um, and, and now let's, um, we could kind of combine those two to kind of see what their house income is yes. going to be. And then take away uh, with the different things that they pay for on a yearly basis yes so with crunching the numbers you have these people making as a house approximately about half a million dollars a year right. pre-tax right with taxes however is when it gets really uh, uh to say, sad to say unsavory right because you have not only the federal income tax and yeah. but you also have the state taxes and the mm -hmm. locality of california of right. los angeles california so they're paying upwards of almost half of their money um and you think, oh, oh, yeah, but you know, half of half a million is still really good, and it's like, yeah, but mm -hmm. you have to consider where they're living and the lifestyle that they are achieving. Right, because you have uh, uh, they're living in Sherman Oaks, which is a nice part of L.A. Yes, and then on top of it, they have all their kids in uh, private school or have had all their kids in private school. So that's yes, four, uh, four to three, four, two, currently two, but let's talk about the before uh, college. Even they, they, they had like four to three kids in private school, mm -hmm. you know, before they, they put them in a public school. And yes, so with private school, that costs as much as, you know, college mm -hmm. tuition a year. Right. So we're talking about 10, uh, 10 to $20,000 a year per kid. Right. And then we also have to consider the house that they live in. And uh, apologies if we sound like we're rushing a little bit. It's just that we've been talking about the whole of black TV and I guess the origins of it and I guess I think they're gonna have no qualms no qualms <laughs> no 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 yeah. okay um so yeah I, I, and just to quickly demonstrate and before we continue though Akis I also wanted to know was there is blackish a good summation point that we can get to yeah 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 that and then we talk about the future okay. awesome yeah um, so for all of us, I would say that, uh, back to the numbers at hand, you have, uh, Bo and Dre, which mm. are making, like you said, about half a million dollars a year. Um, and then half of that, you have to remember too, that their house they're living in, which, you know, uh, media would have us believe is a middle class home <sighs> is, is quite honestly approaching a one percenter home yes. in lo the Los Angeles area. Right. Um, because the one percent salary, uh, believe it or not. To be making 1% in Atlanta would be somewhere around $500,000 a year or $600,000 yeah. a year as a household. Mm -hmm. And for LA, it'd be probably about seven to $800,000 a year. Right. And the house was very illustrious and it had a suite for uh, like a whole separate guest house. Yes. Um, so that's where housing affordability comes into play for them. Uh, yeah. They're not, you know, people making that much money are not immune to housing affordability problems. Right. So uh, then you add in a nanny. <laughs> and the nanny and things like that. But, you know, Bo and Dre's house, uh, looking at approximations of it in Zillow and things like that, it's a $1.5 to $2 million house with a right. mortgage anywhere in the range of uh, uh, $10,000 a month and up. Oh, my gosh. And not to mention the HOA fees. Yeah. And HOA fees, I mean, that's a whole discussion and a half because that's basically like you know, local communism. Yeah. <laughs> you put all your money into this thing and mm -hmm. we'll take care of you, comrades. But Right. <laughs> Uh, so you got all those factors. Yeah, and I was really crunching the numbers because you know Dre has that closet full of Jordans, and those are two or three hundred bucks a pop. And exactly. That's, you had upwards of fifty pairs, and you have them new going new cars. up in new cars with payments that are approaching a thousand dollars a month per car. Right. Um, and we're talking about all of this. I really was seeing that in reality, those guys were only able to probably pocket maybe two or three thousand dollars a month if they were diligent. 
if they were on their P's and Q's. And pocketing two or three thousand dollars a month sounds like fantastic for a majority of us, but these guys have a mortgage at the end of the day mm -hmm. that is ten thousand dollars. Exactly. So a lot of their they were bleeding money uh, uh, yeah. in that situation. And so it really just goes to show just how realistic, uh, unreal, or just how much of a strain that the family of Blackish would have actually been going through, but that's not being shown. And so it's kind of like a carrot that's being dangled in front of us that's not really truly accurate. And if you were to attain it, for instance, you know, you wouldn't have a show because Dre, you know, him in the middle of a conversation with Junior would have a phone call and he would have to take it. Or both, she would often she would barely be home from work. Exactly, especially being on a medical board now. Oh yeah, and uh, the the work life balance. Um, there's so many caveats to that lifestyle right. that are not properly addressed. You know, and you know, in the plot, it's convenient when someone has right. to go take a phone call. Exactly. But you know, we don't talk about this. But when the father's giving the lesson at the end of the show, in reality, mm -hmm. he could be. 10 minutes deep into a serious conversation with the son and have to take a phone call yeah. and not finish his lesson. Yeah. Seriously. And it's like, oh, well, that's the reality. Right. So we have the taxation, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, I'm not going to say anything as far as are the rich people paying enough or are they not paying enough? Uh, that's that's a whole discussion for another time. But the reality of the taxation, that they, right. there is a, a higher taxation um, for those that don't have the means to afford lawyers to negotiate lower taxes right, right, right. because the bezos and all of them yes they get tax breaks and things like that but we're mm -hmm. talking about the the lawyers and doctors you know they may have a tax lawyer that can do some savvy stuff here and there but right. we're not talking on this on the level of like the government owing me money type of deal exactly. uh so they have to pay a lot in taxes they mm -hmm. had to work their tails off to get to that position right. their work-life balance is not as it is shown in the tv show right and, and um, a lot of other expenses. They're saving up for college, for instance. And saving up for college. Uh, it's a lot of people can be house rich, and uh, but actually um, broke in reality, though. Right, when it comes to actual income. And not able to uh, afford any calamity. Right. Um, they were paycheck to paycheck. As much as someone in the middle of Compton or something like that, they right. were as paycheck to paycheck as them. Mm -hmm. And it just has a nice has a nicer ring to it, but right. and a nicer, you know, bends, but... At the end of the day, they were one calamity away from going into serious debt. Yeah. Assuming that they paid off both their student loan debts. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So uh, uh, we definitely just wanted to, we wanted to do that breakdown to kind of show, uh, uh, you know, that shows like uh, Blackish and all these other different shows, they're not really accurate when it comes to showing and portraying the the, the black uh, uh, familial experience or what we should be striving for. And uh, uh, bringing those things up, and, and that's not even, I feel like we've touched a lot on uh, the various agenda, that the agendas that have been pushed uh, on Blackish before uh, in the past on the Black narrative, so uh, we won't go too deep into that. But uh, for you, Mark, what would you want to see in the future of Black television? I think for the future, it would definitely be... Yes, still maintaining a few examples of the higher end for giving mm -hmm. people uh, something to look forward to. Um, and like you said, diversifying. I'm not saying for everyone they have to go be in private enterprise and go do their own, you know, right, Fortune right, 500 right. company and stuff. But, you know, a little bit more representation in the, you know, typical good old boy system mm -hmm. uh, with more realistic circumstances in the family. And then also for uh, the uh, a show or two exploring Black right. enterprise, such as uh, Insist Assisted with the dad owning a taxi company, right. or sorry, a limousine company. Yeah. Um, because, you know, they didn't get into the nitty gritty like that. I hardly ever see him, you know, at work and all that stuff. But right. if he has enough home, time at home to be there for his kids, you know, that's really all that we a needed to see. Good work-life uh, work -life balance. So in that end, I would like to see uh, a little bit of the mid-range where you're talking about mm -hmm. a realistic, like... Uh, show and like, we haven't even gotten into it, which is so terrible. But like uh, uh, with Atlanta and uh, Donald Glover and like his parents, they yeah. were what you would typically call or attribute to middle class. Yeah. Um, and more so the ex exploration of that kind of thing. Right. Or he, maybe lower middle class, but yeah. yeah but he even uh, went to a prominent school. I can't remember which one in the show, but you know, like, gosh, that's that 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 in itself is another uh, case study. But 
Uh, we'll save that for another time. And then finally, I would want to see uh, a few examples of someone that does grow up in adjunct poverty, but right. the, the the exploration of concepts and the debauchery around them and how they can choose to ascend above that. Exactly. Uh, for me personally, one thing that I would like to see more of is um, definitely more of a representation of black unity in mm -hmm. these different shows because uh, uh, in a lot of uh, different shows you have kind of like a, okay I made it and that's it and oftentimes even in a show like Blackish I've, I, I noticed that oftentimes uh, the black characters that they show were I mean maybe like a couple ones that w worked within the good old boy system or uh, uh, family uh, members that were you know down on their luck and you know uh, uh, you know just made an appearance but I would like to see shows that kind of showcase us in more of a um, communal sense, in mm -hmm. a way. And another another thing is I would like to see more of a um, good, uh, um, you know, father and mother uh, 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 role models. You know what I mean? Kind of um, good role models for uh, black men and black women, uh, uh, you know, to kind of um, guide the children. And even on the topic of uh, 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 children, I would like to see more... Uh, black TV shows that are geared towards children so you know they have that kind of representation as well and uh, uh, are able to see that you know I don't have to uh, uh, be like those people on this of course this is nine-year-old Akis uh, talking but you know like those people on 106 and Park you know what I mean you don't have to aspire to be like Jeezy yeah. <laughs> you know or or, or, or um, you know uh, uh, T.I. you yeah. know so uh, that, that, that those would be things that I would like to see, and then also, um, you know, bringing back more of a, a gamut of uh, black um, characters. As far as I like how, you know, certain TV shows show, you know, like a Steve Urkel, you know, because Steve Urkels exist. Did I do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like, not not everybody needs to be a thug. Not everybody needs to be. Miss Popular. Uh, right, Miss Popular. Not everybody needs to be out in the streets. Not everybody. There's a lot. We're not monolithic at all. And I think, like, I would like to see more shows that encompass that. You know, so that's what I'm hoping um, for the future of black television. And uh, this is, of course, you know, just a, a conversation kind of running the span of that because I, I do notice um, that there is a, a, a gap in the, the black creative space that I feel like could be Field and I would really like it if, um, you know, any black creators were to hear this and kind of be inspired to fill that gap with something that would behoove uh, the black community and the black consciousness in a way. And I mean, it doesn't need to be anything preachy or, you know, uh, 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 overly righteous or zealous, but, you know, something that doesn't detract from us, you know, something that we could actually um, enjoy and kind of uh, 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 glean some good lessons from without it being political or you know like uh blackish did you know try to solidify us with uh uh it, try to solidify uh uh being a democrat within our culture you know i would like some apart from that you know but uh any parting words mark for uh, the audience or I, I think i couldn't have said it better myself um and there's just a lot to uh look at in the past there's a lot to observe in the present and there's a lot to speculate on and discuss in the future and just uh hopefully that this discussion could inspire those listeners all of you to to keep more of a watchful eye and uh definitely have some critical thinking when you're watching the show of what angle are they pushing what are they showing and right. rewarding what are they um kind of preaching as normal or attainable right exactly or expected of you staying vigilant vigilant yes you're right and uh, so with that, uh, family, it was a good talk. And if you made it this far, <laughs> props. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this was uh, it for today. And be one. See you in the next broadcast.